Okay. Good morning, members, on this lovely sunny day. Hi, uh, Cheryl. We're ready to we're ready to start then. Uh, good morning. My name is Councillor Cheryl Carlisle, and I'm the chair of the Finance and Resources Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Can I welcome everyone to the meeting, which is a multi-location meeting? The meeting will be live streamed and recorded and will be available for viewing after the meeting. Should the live streaming fail, the meeting will continue and a recording will be available through the Council's website following the conclusion of the meeting. Can I remind members that translation facilities are available and for those attending remotely to choose your language of choice. For those wishing to speak in the chamber, please raise your hand. For those attending remotely, please use the raised hand function. We will alternate between speakers in the chamber and remote attendees. For those attending remotely, please note that those in the chamber will be unable to use the chat facility, so please can you make the comments. Uh, committee members who are attending remotely are required to leave their camera on throughout the debate and when voting in order to maintain the integrity of the decision making process. If you do need to leave the meeting temporarily, pop a message in the chat function so the Democratic Services Officer is aware and then let us know when you return. I expect everyone present and participating in this meeting to conduct themselves appropriately and be respectful to each other. That applies to members, officers and anyone in the public gallery. When I open up the debate to members, I will ask committee members to speak and put their questions first, followed by non-committee members. Whilst I do not wish to stifle debate, can I remind members that any question should be focused on the subject matter and to avoid repetition. If I feel the length of individual speeches are negatively impacting on the overall time for discussion and becoming unmanageable, I will defer to the committee's rules of procedure, which limits the length of speeches to five minutes. Can I remind members that there is an exempt item, there are exempt items on the agenda today, and that you should be the only person in the room able to hear any confidential and exempt items being discussed. And during items eight and nine, there are exempt pages. So if you wish to discuss this, in particular details, then we'll discuss those in committee. But if not, then it will all be discussed in public and we will be taking advice off our monitoring office for that. And just to note for item eight, uh, development of the 3G pitch at Park Arius, a notice of motion, I will be handing the chairing of this item to our vice chair, Councillor Dilwyn Roberts. Okay, so moving on to the agenda. First of all, I'm not sure, um, Leader, if you wanted to say a couple of words on the rack concrete issue, given the, the pressing nature of, of um, the concerns that are out there, where, where we're up to in Conway, it would be really helpful. Thanks. Sorry, um, hospital pass. No, at this moment in time, work is ongoing, and I'll try and get some out to members as soon as possible, but it would be premature of me to say something. No, sure. We will be meeting after this meeting, um, and we you know, we take it incredibly seriously. But I will get some of the members as soon as I have factual information on that. Great, thank you very much, Leader. Okay, we'll start with item one. Apologies for absence. No apologies, Chair. Lovely, thank you. Uh, item two: declarations of interest. Have we any declarations of interest, members? No. Nope. Okay, we move on to item three, urgent matters. Not aware of any this morning. Uh, we move on to item four, minutes of the Governance and Audit Committee. To receive for information the minutes of the Governance and Audit Committee held on 31st of July, 2023, pages four to eight. Have we a proposer and a seconder? Councillor Stephen proposed. Have and Councillor Dilwyn second. Could could members show, please? And online. Anyone against? No. Any abstentions? No. Thank you very much. Okay, we move on to item five questions to cabinet members that are none. And we move on then. Item 6A, Establishment of Office Accommodation, Part 2, Project, pages 9 to 33. Councillor Charlie is going to introduce the report and uh, Blethyn Evans, our County Valuer and Asset Manager, will present the report. So, Leader, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, this is part of a process we've already approved um, the outline business case for the accommodation of a strategy in May and June in 2023. Clearly, this is a really vitally important piece of work. It's complex, but the changes we will make will impact on this council for many years to come. So it's absolutely right that we take it with the utmost seriousness. Um, and the report 
clearly states that's how, how we'll propose to do that, Chair. So I'm happy to let our officers walk us through the report. Thank you, Councillor Charlie. Uh, I'd like to bring uh, Blethyn in, please. Morning, Blethyn. Morning, Buddha. So, yeah, um, the report that you find before you is uh, obviously a, a, a much shorter report than the uh, reports that came before Frosk in May and then Cabinet in June. Um, and I think it's fair to say they were kind of, yeah, well discussed and debated then. And um, the democratic um, uh, support then was for uh, us to develop a full business case, uh, which we will then bring back to democracy uh, in early 2024. Perhaps in terms of taking that forward, we need to set up a project um, in, de in developing the full business case um, and in developing and taking forward that project. Um, that project board needs a nomination from Frosk as well for a member of a scrutiny to sit on that board. Um, the report also um, seeks support for the addition of a, to the capital programme of the monies detailed in the outline business case in the order of £255,000, monies that will be required um, you know, to obviously develop the full business case in terms of um, external support required, internal fees that we'll need paying as well. Um, so that's, I guess, a quick overview of the report. Um, in terms of the recommendations, the recommendations are that Frost will obviously scrutinise the report, uh, make a recommendation to Cabinet. Cabinet will sit next week, which is the 12th of, um, 12th of September. Um, so that's one of the recommendations. The other recommendation is that Frost nominates a member to sit on the project board. Um, so I'll keep it as short and, as that, uh, Council Chair. Um, and then obviously um, open to any questions, comments, clarifications from members of Frost. Thank you very much for that, Blethyn. Members, questions? Councillor Harry, first question. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I, I don't know who would be best to answer this, but looking through the report, I noticed one of the drivers behind the one office strategy was having more staff effectively in work, uh, working in Colwyn Bay and adding to the local economy there and increasing footfall. Um, what I'd like to know, and I don't want to open a previous debate, but how do we square that with the drive towards hybrid working? It seems very much that we've adopted a policy to, put bluntly, move staff out of Quaid Pashla, which would therefore ensure we have less staff there contributing to the economy in Colwyn Bay. And now we're saying, we want to put more staff there to contribute to to the economy locally. Um, not against the idea of consolidating our office stock and moving ahead with a business case for this at this stage. But I would like to know how those two competing policies actually overlap and come together. Who's going to take this? I can answer that. Um, I guess in a nutshell, um, within the report that went to Frost back in May and then Cabinet in June, um, in terms of the, st the statistics that we had, there's sufficient capacity within Koi Pesha to absorb staff from Bodlonda, um, more than enough. Um, so I guess, um, as, as, as a, hence the driver for the one office uh, strategy insofar as um, you know, in terms of floor space, uh, we've got enough floor space to host the amount of staff that we've got, um, you know, working in an agile, in an agile way. Um, you only need to kind of, you know, look back in terms of stats that we had for Bodlondam in terms of the number of people there, um, which were pretty low. And then also the backlog maintenance and the revenue costs involved in running Bodlondam. Um, so I guess that would have been discussed and detailed in the report back in May and June. Um, so, yeah, and I've got nothing really more to add to it, to be honest, Councillor Harry. Whether that answers your question or not. Um, um, yeah. Well, not, not really. If we want to have staff work in Colwyn Bay, why have we got a policy where we encourage staff to work from home, which may not be in Colwyn Bay? It's well, it's not a difficult yeah. one. It's, it's, we're not we're not encouraging really staff to work at home, are we? To, Chief Exec is going to come in and answer that. Yeah, and and uh, the the point Blevin just made, we're we're not encouraging staff to work exclusively from home. It is a hybrid working, which means there is office and home working. You have members of staff who will be full time in the office. You will have members of, of staff who will be working on specific days. I think to answer your point. At the moment, we're spread over two offices, aren't we? 
So, so by consolidating the number of staff who are in the office at any given time in the office in Coit Petla, that should drive the numbers up in terms of usage of that building, which I hope would answer your question on that. Um, we have to make better use of our estate, don't we? That, that's the bottom line. Um, this will provide the information. So let's bear in mind that this is not a decision that we've made yet. We've got a business case that's coming through that will cover some of the matters that you're raising, Councillor Harry. So um, I'm not going to preempt anything. But, you know, from the report that came earlier in the year, we know, as Blenin said, there's capacity in Coit Petla to encompass the numbers that we have in Bodlondeb. And that would mean that we would be able to utilise our estate in a more efficient way. So I think this will come out in the business case, won't it? A lot of this information, the facts behind whether it's worth it or not, on every uh, aspect of this will come out in the business case. This report is setting up the group that will have control over that process. So um, so I hope that at least answers some of your queries, Councillor Harry. Intent, Councillor Harry? Not, not especially. I don't think I said that we exclusively are staff to work from home. I think the chief exec read that word into uh, into my comments. But we can I'm conscious the report today is about setting up that that group, so we can perhaps come back to this at a later date. Can I just correct? Um, I think the words you used were in, we're, we're encouraging people to work from home. That's not that's not what we're doing. We're giving options in terms of a hybrid working model, which gives the ability to work agilely. So we're not encouraging people to work at home. We're making uh, the working environment more agile. So I, I, I completely accept that you didn't say exclusively, Councillor Harry. I completely accept. So sorry, I don't, I don't want to get into semantics here, but we're saying, you know, oh. we want to make the option, uh, give staff the option to work in an agile environment. I entirely understand that. Surely, by giving them that option, you are encouraging them to do that. And one of the places they may work from is home, aren't we? I. I Again, I don't want to get into the semantics of this either. It gives an option to people to work from home, yeah. but if there's a business need for them to be in the office, they're in the office. So, you know, I, I, I yeah, I, I'll bring that conversation to an end now. That's fine. <laughs> don't you love Monday mornings? Okay, uh, thank you both. Uh, Councillor Andrew next online. Thank you. Morning, Jim. Morning, Chair. Um, Morning. Thank you. Uh, just uh, very simply, I've been involved with um, Bled with this since January, February this year, and with some of our members. Then we brought it to the reports in May and June um, for the committee to see. Um, I just want to say that at the same time that we're always very, very sensitive for the work that's been done already, very sensitive to the local Conway members and, of course, the property itself. We're looking towards a one business strategy, but um, I would just um, I would say that the you know, work that Bladen's done has been absolutely first class in that last uh, synopsis around 200 pages. You want to get a, a, a better um, delve into what would what the future could be, including you know uh, testing the water, as they say, for the various projects. So I could like to thank Bladen on that behalf. Thank you very much, and uh, and, and to and to Councillor Harry, I would say. I see a lot of things have changed over the last couple of years, and I think a few things will change again. So let's just um, bide our time and see what actually this happens. Yeah, we need to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Andrew. Next, Councillor Sean online, please. Thank you. Um, just uh, two little queries, really. One, when we were in the Frost meeting last week, oh, yeah, last week, I think it was, um, that new projects were being put on hold or anything. I wondered if if this money is already allocated or is it come on hold? I obviously don't understand the full workings. Um, and the other one is my concern for Bedlonda, obviously, as the ward member. Um, and the reason my concern is because we've still got the civic hall still going ongoing after all the years that it's been ongoing and we still haven't got a decision on that. We, it hasn't come to a conclusion. It's gradually falling apart. And my worry is that the Donda will go the same way. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sean. Um, okay, the new projects on hold. Amanda, do you want to take that one? Uh, yes. That question? Um, uh, 
thank you chair um yeah uh no it's not currently in the capital program so effectively this report is asking for uh approval or, or approval when it goes to cabinet uh, to add it into the capital program um um with with uh, i think a recommendation that it's funded from uh, our existing capital reserves uh so in that context um assuming cabinet approve it then then effectively it is being put as a priority of, of for the council uh above above other, other capital projects thank you thank you thank you man uh, are you content with that count that part of the answer councillor sean yes thank you and the second who's going to take the second questions around uh bod and the civic hall I'll yeah I'll take yeah, can't, yeah take I'll take that one um, yes um, it it is a risk um, however however um, I guess there are two set well, two different animals in terms of the civic hall conduit and Bodlondeb, uh, you know from a marketability or a commercial element let alone the planning element as well um, but obviously we will be cognizant in terms of lessons learned from the civic. Um, hall experience uh, and obviously obviously be very careful in how we deal with um, Bodlonda, hopefully not to kind of repeat um, similar issues there, which are issues outside of our control, just mindful of the commercial market that we're working or operating in, plus the planning environment as well. But yeah, it's a fair comment and as we'll take it on board as the as the project moves forward. Thank you, Blethyn. You, you can thank Councillor Sean. Uh, well, not really, obviously, but yeah, it, I just needed to bring the subject up because I, I understand it's more commercially viable, obviously, and planning slightly different, but not not really because it's still in exactly the same ward <clears throat> with the castle and everything else that comes into it. The UNESCO, it's still there. I know it's slightly different because it's outside the town walls. But it still has exactly the same planning uh, regulations or go uh, against it and the public as well. And we may well still encounter a lot of the same problems over the years, which obviously that deteriorates the building even more. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Sean. Um, before I go to Councillors Anne and Nigel, uh, Councillor Paul and Gareth, were those particular questions on on what Councillor Sean said, or do you, are you too content to go on to the end of the? Oh. Slight connection with mine. Uh, I was just going to ask if there's a is there a place on the board for the lo for the local member in addition to the Frosk member, or is it no local? You know, is is it going to somewhere basically? Yeah. Is there somewhere specific for the local member to be a member of the board, or is it just for a member of Frosk to be on the board? I think have you got the makeup of the board there? Uh, the makeup of the board is in the is in the report and in the project brief. Um, and all we're asking uh, is a nomination from Frosk. So um, there isn't a local member on the board. Uh, the members are currently on the board or proposed to be on the board are the leader and then the cabinet member for finance. And then the third one would be, um, I said, the Frosk nomination. Um, whether there's a Conway member that currently sits on Frosk, I don't know. Um, but uh, as I think the proposal is, um, there are three members, um, as I there's one kind of seat up for grabs. Thank you, Blethyn. Maybe we can discuss that um, aspect under the recommendations then when we get to the recommendations. I'll now move to Councillor Anne. Yes, thanks, thanks Shan online. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I mean, Shan, Shan got ahead of me there in terms of I was going to ask the same question about the capital spend, because it is quite concerning that, you know, week after a report where we're pausing um, any any implementation of the existing capital programme, here we are proposing to add another quarter of a million pounds to it. Um, so that, that is certainly something that's a bit of a concern to me in terms of a strategic approach to capital spending. Um, um, but I do wonder, whilst I, obviously I support the setting up of this pro, this project board, is the timing right to determine on the quarter of a million pounds capital spend? 
because we're doing so in a vacuum of other potential additional capital spend. And that's around the pressing need for overarching transformation across the whole of the council on the back of um, we can't we can't afford to live within our means. And the fact that the, the, the peer uh, group have recommended that we need to really put our heart and soul uh, and roll our sleeves up into transformation. So I do wonder if we should be making a quarter of a million spending commitment when actually this is part of a, a completely bigger picture. Um, so that would be my first question. I'm not quite sure that, you know, a few months of delay until we get to groups where with where the direction of travel is with transformation is 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 actually going to be that significant. So, you know, is it should we delay is my question. And then the second sort of question I've got and really, I mean, it, it is to a degree on the back of, again, the, the, the meetings we've had in the last couple of weeks. Um, and that's to do with exclusions. And I know we discussed this, but I make no apology from bringing it back up because last week we had a projected budget shortfall of up to 30 million and confirmation that at the end of quarter one of the current year, we're already projecting a five million pounds overspend. Do we not need to be more radical in reducing our costs and overheads, which is what goes to the heart of the objectives of this particular project? I mean, Councillor Mike, whilst he was in the finance portfolio, did say these are eye-watering sums, i.e. up to 30 million pounds. But don't we need action um, and not words? So, you know, why exclude, for example, the Market Street offices in Abergelly and whatever offices we've got in Park Areas? Are they not actually really close to Koi Pekla? Um, so should we not cons consolidate these locality operations um, in Colwyn Bay and in Abergelly within Koi Pekla? Is that not the obvious thing to do? So two questions. Thank you, Councillor Anne. Uh, I don't know, Lee, if you want to take the one on the capital spend and the transformation. Thank you. So it's absolutely clear that we as a council are facing really difficult times. We have to therefore look to drive down <coughs> our costs. So that is the main driver. This building is around up to about half a million pounds a year. It's got a, a, a real backfall of work that needs to be spent on it. We have an opportunity to consolidate and drive those costs down. We could look to get a capital receipt from this building. The longer we delay doing that, the less of a saving there will be and the more the cost will be. In terms of the other buildings, you know, we, we are focusing on, on the big wins at the moment, but I, I take Anne's point that clearly we would want to look to reduce our running costs wherever we could, but we also do not want to make sure that, you know, services are available in the areas where they're, where they're needed, but that will all be part of the process. And the, the points Councillor Shan makes about the need to find a really good viable use for this building in terms of the economy of the town is vitally important as well. And that's why we're setting up this board. That's why it's it's an extensive piece of work because we need to get this right. But I, I don't think a delay is the right way. Um, we have to do things differently. And sometimes you have to invest some money in, in order to make those long-term savings. And I'm confident that this is what's being proposed here. Thanks, Chair. Chair, can I just come back on that? Yes, you can, Councillor Anne. I mean, I mean, I think Charlie and I are, are both um, in total agreement. We need to progress with this. My my real question about delay is, given the fact that we're going to have to to um, decide and determine a huge amount of extra money for transformation, surely we should delay this and and rather than do it in silos. In, in little sort of parcels? Should we not take a bigger, broader strategic approach to actually allocating the, the capital funding around transformation? And actually what does a couple of months um, make of difference in terms of just um, delaying the decision on spend, not about the project board and setting up and starting its work? Because I would assume, uh, although there's no detail within the report, that from the get go, you don't on day one start to spend some money. So I just think we need prudence and we need a bit of you know strategic thinking and action around spending money um, in the right way at the right time um, and in the right context, because we don't actually know the size of what cabinet um, is actually going to put in front of us and officers in terms of transformation across the council to live within our means. So yeah, I, I don't find my question sort of answered really. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anne. Um, 
Okay, we now move on. Uh, no, chair, chair, second part of my question was, should we be excluding um, the Abergelly uh, locality building and should we be excluding the, whatever uh, existing commitment we've got within areas? Should we not be consolidating further, being more radical actually, and not ruling things out, but actually ruling them in because they're actually in quite close proximity to Koi Pekla? Charlie Blethin. I can answer, yeah. Blethin. Council Charlie, then I can pick up. No far ahead, Blethin, thanks. Okay, in terms Blethin, of, please. yeah, so in terms of uh, rationale for excluding um, those properties that you listed there, Councillor Anne, they were in the report back in May and June. In terms of the Market Street offices in, uh, in Abergele, that's not a Conwood building, it's owned by the Health Board, and that's a locality hub. Uh, in terms of uh, you know social care workers working within that kind of a eastern area of the county, um, so it'd be very difficult. And I guess then there'll be kind of other costs uh, if all of that would be then kind of lifted and shifted into Koi Uh In terms of um, the offices in Ayres Park, again that's a locality hub. Um, again shared with the health board. Um, again, you know. They, this is, this is a, that is, as I said, that's got a kind of a, you know, it's, it's a different feel altogether to Coy Petha. Um, in terms of the other assets that were listed back in the report back in May and June, Clear Stuvrig and Canol van Kroost. Uh, again, we're on leases there, um, which have got years to run. Again, locality hubs. Um, you know, there's another office over in Thamavechem, a Plas Menai, a locality hub. And in discussions with social care at the time, you know, they, they, those offices needed to be in those localities. Whether social care's um, vision may change over time, um, it may then just be possibly another phase of office accommodation. Um, but Councillor Charlie quite rightly um, pointed out in terms of, I think, I think the prize is much greater if we focus in on Bodlonda, um, just mindful of the backlog maintenance, mindful that we own it, uh, mindful of the revenue costs there. And if we start making it too big an animal um as I said, we may just kind of lose sight on possibly um, um optimizing the potential savings and uh, um, as i said improving that working environment but certainly something that could be looked at at, at a later date not too far a later date anyway um so yeah sorry my, my dog started back as well as the post, <laughs> post, post, post i'll bring the dog in next don't worry thank you thank C councillor Anne. you you content yeah, no, thanks for that, Blythe. I mean, I, I must admit, I mean, I, I do understand the piece about leases opposed, as opposed to ownership. And really, I'm just um, really anxious that we are ambitious to actually really reduce our number of properties, our headcount in terms of property and indeed our, our running costs. So I, I completely sort of take your feedback on that. I'm less convinced overall in terms of what I've raised about the wisdom of making a half a million pounds decision here when we could actually delay that until after October when we understand what the transformation pro proposal is. But um, that's just my personal view. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Anne. Now bringing Councillor Nigel, then Councillor Paul, and we're going to go to recommendations after that. Thank you. Councillor Nigel. Thank you very much, Chair. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Excellent. Thank you very much and uh, for allowing me to speak. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the office strategy policy, it, it's nothing new. It's something that we've been dealing with certainly for eight years that I can remember that I've been a county councillor when we purchased... Um, the old DHSS offices in Colwyn Bay. We now have a spectacular Coed Petler office there that accommodates our staff, bringing footfall into that uh, fabulous town of Colwyn Bay with our officers spending money locally, bolstering the economy there. It, it, it's a win-win. We've, With the purchase of that property, I think we reduced our assets by about 14 buildings. I think I think we were, we were able to, to um, sell off um, which reduced our carbon footprint, no doubt, and our maintenance costs. And this is just a, another progression of that, is to look uh, to the future. And to develop a business case is the way that you have to do it. It's a democratic process. And I see it as a spend to save. So we're spending this money to make sure <clears throat> that this is the right thing to do. The business case is correct. 
and that it fits with our with our focus and and our vision for the future. Um, so I fully support this. Uh, I, I, it, it's a progression and it's 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 the journey that we've been on for a number of years now, and I fully support it. If I could, Chair, I would like to move the recommendations, but I noticed that 2.2, you're looking for a nomination from the members of, uh, of Frost. Um, and I'd like to nominate uh, Councillor Andrew Wood, if I could. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Councillor Nigel. We were going to have a discussion around um, local members, weren't we, before we went to the uh, recommendations about that. But have, have we a second? Of, oh, yes. Um, Thank you. Yeah, on, on that point, uh, Chair, I, I, I think as far as our structures are concerned, we would really invite local members to sit on boards. So um, I think you can take that as read, really, that we will be doing that. I, I was just looking at the, at, the, at the structure document we've got, and if it affects an area specifically, we would invite local members anyway. So I think I think you can take that on board. Excellent. Well, we, we should deal with that during the recommendations. And so you've recommended Councillor Andrew Wood. How, how, do we have a second for that before we go to Councillor Paul? Councillor Stephen. Lovely, thank you. OK, uh, last speaker, Councillor Paul in the chamber. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I raised this issue um, at the Frost uh, last week as well. Obviously, the one office strategy is fundamentally about productivity, making sure uh, we are effective. And um, that's why I'm fully supportive of the recommendations. Um, the most recent data said clearly public sector output is 5.7% lower than pre pandemic times and this compared to the private sector which is 1.3 percent higher so in a sense this um whole strategy needs to in ensure that our productivity is improved and i'm sure when i'm blevins all over this and understands that but that's what we need to have reassurance in when we when the, the one office strategy is finally implemented because it, it's all about making sure we're more efficient and more effective than we are today. So uh, I think as long as we 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 note that all the way through this process, and uh, I think uh, the nomination of Andrew as the chair is imp important because he chaired the task and finish group that's got us to this point anyway. So that's the logical route to take, I think. Thank, thank you, Councillor Paul. And obviously, now we've had um, the confirmation, uh, Councillor Sean will be able to um, sit on, on the board as a local member. That Oh, Councillor Gromley? Yeah, you you say a local on. member, this will affect not only Budlonda, but also affect, affects Cohen Bay. So you're saying that we should have the local members from Cohen Bay, which is two boards, basically. So you, you could end up with five local members being on the board, which is a ridiculous number. I think it's about respect. Councillor Sean has been very, um, very vocal about this as the local member for Conway. As it's it's, it's going to do with respect it's about having equality, isn't it? You talk about the, the effect on Conway, but there will be a significant, significant effect on Conway Bay as well. Green, would you like to come in? Thank you very much. Yeah, I accept the point, but I, I, I do think um, we are not. The proposal in respect to Conway Bay is increasing numbers within an existing office building. So that is, is different to um, dealing with this building, which, you know, um, we, the, the recommendation, the previous report was about a one office strategy. So that would mean that this building may close. So um, I think that could have a, a more of an effect. So therefore, I would consider that that probably would be the reasoning behind the local members in Conway may be having... But obviously, any consultation process would involve members from yeah. Cohen as well, wouldn't it? So, so th that that would cover that element off. But I, I do accept the point that in terms of, we also need a workable group here, don't we? We we have to have something that would move things forward as well, and and you know we could end up with with a position where where 
it would be a substantial board uh, of, of, and therefore the reassurance, I guess, would be around that any decision, any decision would be through the democratic process. This is not a decision making board, is it? It's, it is to make recommendations that then flow through democracy. So, so hopefully that gives the reassurance to the remainder of the members. Thank you very much for that, Reid. Councillor Sean, would you like to come back in? Thank you for letting me come back in. Just, I was just uh, like to know if Councillor Ann is uh, putting forward a proposal to recommend we delay this. Chair, do you want me to come in? I do, please, Councillor Ann. Yeah, Sean, I think, I mean, I am, I am happy to do, I'm not to delay the setting up of the, um, the project board, um, so it can go ahead with this work as far as I'm concerned. But my, my concern is about committing the uh, sum of quarter of a million with no detail and in the light of a far bigger transformation project. So my proposal would be that we delay allocating the capital funding to this project until members are fully briefed on the peer review action plan and capital revenue funding requirements for transformation. Thank you for that, Councillor Anne. Have we a second for that? Proposal? I'd like to second that, please. Thank you. Okay. So, Matt, here we go. Chair, my, my suggestion would be with us, we've essentially got three different proposals. Um, my suggestion would be do we deal with the nomination first? And then we can deal with, we, we, in, in respect of uh, 2.4, we have a proposition that's been seconded to delay. Um, that, uh, that that allocation of that funding. So perhaps we could uh, take a vote on on that recommendation first, and then um, deal with the uh, endorsing the brief and the establishment of, of the project. Okay, so we'll start with the member. We've had a, a proposal and a seconder for Councillor Andrew to be the Frost representative on the board so we're taking that now i think first chair do we have any other nominations first in respect to the board member or or, or, or... well can, can, can i we... maybe just propose councillor sean as the local conway member if if it's limited to one position on the board um i i don't think we need to worry about that in terms of um we can add to the brief that the local members are invited anyway. So um, it's obviously a matter for the committee if they want to uh, nominate Councillor Shan, um, but but the local members should be invited in any event to, to, to attend the board. Shall we make that as part of our proposal then? Oh, Councillor Stephen. Sorry, I'd just like clarification on, on Councillor Anne's proposal. Is she proposing that Shan, is, as a member of FOSB, part of that project board or is she proposing that she be a member of, of the ward i think i proposed as the local member stephen so there would be a, an additional frosk um member as well which is part of the original brief here thanks yeah um the, the, as i said the the the, the management structure document says that local members should be invited to be members of the board anyway so so we, we would we would add that so that the two Conway members would be automatically invited to be board members in addition to what's being proposed here. So the nomination we're seeking here now is the Frosk representative to be sitting on the board. OK, so just to be clear then, Rena, I'll, I'll withdraw that proposal. Yeah, since it's no longer required, it's just that it wasn't within the brief, was it? It wasn't within the report. I, absolutely, yeah. Councillor Rand, completely agree and 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 it should have been there. So so you're quite right to raise it, Councillor Anne, um, and rest assured okay. that they will be included. Yeah, thanks. No, th thank you both. So we will move to voting on that, whether uh, Councillor Andrew is the representative from Frosk on the board. Could members show, please? Two, three, five, six, six in the room. And how many online? One, two, three, four, five, five online? Seven. Oh, should have gone to spec savers. Okay. Um, anybody against that? And any abstentions? No, that's carried. Thank you. We now move on to. Yeah. So we have a proposition in respect of um, 
the capital budget, which is uh, the, to, to, the, the, there's a recommendation to the cabinet to approve the addition of, of the capital budget to develop the full business case in the sum of 255,000. And we've had a proposition and a seconder that that, that is delayed um, and, until there is further detail about that. Now, I'm not clear what, what detail we're talking about, but that was the proposition. I think Bledin just wants to come in there from the officer perspective. Bledin, thank you. Yeah, the detail was contained in the report back in May and June in terms of the quarter of a million pounds. So the quarter of a million pound is a yeah, sum of money required whereby we will need a property agent to start the soft market test and the marketing of Bodlonda. We will need a planning agent to develop a planning brief for Bodlonda. So we kind of put some form of due, due diligence pack together. Um, we will need ERF consultancy. We will need... Uh, external design consultants to work up draft proposals for Coid Petha. So there's an awful lot of work that needs to be done, that needs to be started now in order for us to kind of go to the project board for a strategic steer on various things. So I think I would just say in terms of the £250,000, um, I said it is basically for, you know, um, I said work solely associated with either Bodlonde or Koi Pesha from a from an ex, you know from a from from gaining external support to undertake that work. Um, and as I said, in terms of delaying or for me not to have a budget to go and commission those people, uh, as I said, it will delay um, um, progress. It will then delay the full business case going to democracy sometime in 2024. And we may end up with a project board that I said, in terms of discussion and in terms of strategic steer, uh, maybe kind of hamstrung by the fact that we're unable to progress certain things which need a budget against. So I just thought I'd add that in terms of context as well. So, yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Bledin. Councillor Anne, do you want to come back? Yeah, just to be clear, I mean, I, I, do, I, I don't disagree that this project um, board needs to be funded. But, you know, this is a piece of scattergun approach rather than a strategic approach for me in terms of allocating capital funds. So, you know, what I'm saying is in a couple of months time, if not earlier, there's to be a, a, a brief for members on the peer review action plan. And then a huge piece of that presumably is around transformation because that's what the peer review group recommendations were, were really centered on in terms of living within our means. So my proposal, just to repeat it so I'm really clear, it is just to delay for those couple of months, the allocating of scarce capital funding of just over a quarter of a million until members are fully briefed on the peer review action plan and the capital and revenue funding requirements contained within the action plan for transformation so it's about bigger picture let's make sure that we're actually allocating money in the right way uh, in the right amounts and that is actually affordable which is part of our ongoing challenge we keep coming up with loads of capital things and then we find we've overextended ourselves so it's about let's delay for a couple of months and then we can actually allocate the, the funding for the whole for the whole shenanigans thanks Thank you, Councillor Anne, for repeating uh, your recommendation. And that was seconded by Councillor Sean. So we're going to deal with that now. So would members like to vote in favour of that, please? Online. One, two, three, four online. Five online. You've obviously got better glasses than me. Um, and none in the room. Okay, so those against. How many on nine? Seven in total. And abstentions. I've got any, yeah two abstentions thank you so that is lost thank you for bringing that councillor Anne. yes yeah, so essentially chair we've got two two recommendations to 2.3 and 2.4 that's the cabinet endorses the brief and the establishment of the project and there's a cabinet approved the addition to the capital funding of 255,000 to develop the full business case to be funded from capital reserves those are recommendations to to to, to cabinet should anybody want to move them Okay. 
Councillor Dilwyn yes. has proposed. Councilor so Councillor Paul has seconded. And would members like to show in favour? Jeff, can we take these two, two proposals separately? Because I'm in favour of one and obviously against the other. So I want to be able to exercise my vote. Thanks. Chair, we can take them separately, although the although Councillor Rand's proposal has been lost. So we we so, go with. Do we do do we have a proposal in second and first then, Chair, for two point three? Uh, Councillor Councillor Harry. Yeah, I'm happy to propose two point three, Chair. You're Thank you. You're proposing two point three. Thank you. Councillor Harry well. and second, thank you, Councillor Nia. So, would members like to show on two point three? Let's be clear. One, two, three, four, five, six, six in the room. One, two, three, four, six or nine. So that's twelve, four. Any against? Any abstentions? No. So 2.3 is carried. Thank you. And we now go to 2.4. Yeah, just, just confirmed. Do you have a proposal in a, a, a proposal for 2.4? Do we have a proposal Post for 2.4? And, oh, and, and a second. Councillor and, Nigel. And a second. Oh, yeah. So. Councillor Nigel has proposed and he's second. I'll second it. Thank you. Okay, can we show on that on 2.4, please? One, two, three, four in the room. Four in the room. One, two, three. Three online. Four in the room, three online. That's seven. Those against, please. One, two, three, three online, four, four online, against, abstentions. any abstentions? Yeah, I think you miscounted the those in favour because Councillor Chris had his digital hand up. No, we do, no. The, the, That's correct, in, in any event, Chair, I don't think we did make an error, but uh, nonetheless, that wouldn't make a difference to the outcome. It's been carried, Chair. Thank you. So uh, we now, yes, where are we at to with the counting for that one? 2.4. That's carried now. Okay. So can we just have the vote? Can we just have the vote, Chair, please, in terms of what the result was? Yes, yeah, 7 4 2 abstention, Chair. Thank you very much, seven, four, and two abstentions. Okay, so that's carried. Well, thank you very much, Blethyn, for, for that report. Thank you, members, for your comments. We now move on to item uh, 7A, levelling up funds, overview pages 34 to 42. Councillor Charlie, the leader, will introduce the report, and uh, Sarah Ecob, Head of Economy and Culture, will present the report. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair, once again. Um, so this is following a request from scrutiny to have an update as to the um, timeline and key information regarding the submissions we put in for the levelling up fund. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank my predecessor, Councillor Louise, who held this portfolio up until uh, May 22. She put a, a huge amount of work into bringing these projects forward, and both our uh, MPs were also uh, very, very supportive and very helpful in doing so. Um, members will be aware that we had one successful bid, which is the coast to um, Valley Transport, and the other two were unsuccessful. In pointing that out, I should note, however, that across the whole of Round 1 and Round 2, there were only 116 out of 834 bids that were actually approved, so that's around a quarter of bids that were submitted were successful, and that no local authority had more than one successful bid. We even have instances, um, Flint being one of the nearest ones, where they had no successful bids whatsoever. So I think our officers should be congratulated on the fact that we have had one successful bid. 
I think members will want to know a bit more about the decision to submit our bid independently of Denbyshire. So in the initial round one, where there was a shared constituency, you had to work with a, another council, um, and the, it was capped at £10 million each. In round two, it was announced that there was a change, that uh, you could go independent bids, and you'd go up for £20 million. So I think there's three real reasons why we decided to do that. In the first instance, if that had been available in round one, I think we would have done it right from the off. Clearly, it's simpler to work in-house rather than have to work with another organisation as well as we get on with our colleagues in Denbyshire. And secondly, it became very clear very early that the actual cost envelope to do something substantial and transformational to the stadium uh, was way in excess of the 10 million. In fact, it was double that. So there was an opportunity to make some real meaningful change there. And I think the third really important point was that within um, the bids, there had to be a real clear link between the two schemes. If you're doing a cr cross authority scheme, um, we didn't see any link between what happened in the south of Denbyshire, which is essentially a, a heritage bid, as opposed to ours, which was trying to uh, create sort of more professional sports facilities for North Wales. Um, so I'll leave it there, Chair, and I'm happy to take any questions just after the... Thank you, Councillor Charlie. Sarah. Yeah, uh, um, thank you. Uh, I, Councillor Charlie has covered most of what I would say, but um, this is a report uh, with the timeline of uh, the levelling up funds and and what we did and uh, the the thought process into it, as uh, Councillor Charlie has said. So, uh, just some key points in March 2021, the levelling up uh, funding was announced in the budget with the deadline of June uh, 2021 for the first uh, round. Um, we didn't have any off the shelf pro uh, projects ready to go. Um, so we started at that point thinking and working towards what we would want to put forwards. And as you will see from the report, there was lots of conversations and discussion and back and forwards around what projects we should submit. In March 2022, round two was announced with the deadline of July. That did extend slightly, but again, really, really tight deadlines compared to what we're used to working for, towards for large scale projects of this kind. Um, we were able to put in um, three bids in total. The, the bids were related to the number of MPs in the area plus one transport bid. So uh, two bids plus transport bid for us. Um, in uh, in round two, we did therefore submit our three bids, Clwyd West, Aberconway, and the transport scheme, which was Coast to Valley. Um, so overall in round two, 11 grants were awarded in Wales. Um, five of those were transport bids. So we were absolutely delighted that we were successful with one of our bids. And there were only three successful applications in North Wales. Uh, we were awarded 18.6 million for our Coast to Valley uh, project, transport project, and ERF colleagues are working on that and uh, reporting separately on that. The feedback we received regarding uh, Cluid West and Abercomway was uh, positive and constructive. Um, the uh, areas that we need to work on were very much reflective of the short lead time that we had to pull these bids together. Um, and certainly will um, we will be looking at those and we have been looking at those so that um, should further funding come forwards, we will be in a position to go forwards should members uh, want us to. Uh, when we uh, went for the round two bids, uh, we had initially been told that there would be three rounds and we were then informed that round three was not a certainty um, and uh, we got various uh, bits of information, um, but it was clear that we may not be able to submit in round three, which is why we pulled all three bids together in round two, which was a huge, huge task for the officers concerned. Um, we are aware that round three is still being discussed. There are no details yet. There is no timeline, um, but hopefully there will be a round three. Uh, we do not know if we will be able to um, submit any bids for this. It may be um, that this is ring fence to certain areas or, or details. Um, at the round one and round two, all spend needs to be made by the end of 2024. So clearly there's a very short timeline to spend the levelling up funding that we have. 
Um, and I'm sure the guidelines will come out for round three shortly. So I think those are the, the key highlights, along with what um, the leader has already said. Um, and uh, obviously happy to take any questions. Dioch. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. Um, questions, members? Councillor Paul. Just a very practical one with the expenditure having to be completed by the end of 2024. Uh, when are we hoping for the contractors for the, uh, the coast of the valley um, route to be on site? On, on site? I know we're going to get further reports from me and ERF on that, but presumably with such tight limits, we should have some indication when this is, as I say, when we've got contractors on site to do the work. Thank you for that very pertinent question, Councillor Sarah. Oh. Uh, I apologise. I, I am not involved uh, with that project. I'm not sure if anybody else in the room would be able to answer that. And if not, obviously, we will come back to you with that, uh, Councillor Paul. Andy, you... Yeah, uh, thanks for the question, Councillor Paul. The Leveling Up Transport Funding Programme is a three-year programme, so the um, <clears throat> the end of expenditure must be March 2026. So we always knew that this first year would be about design, planning, um, uh, looking at various options before coming up with, with the final design planning applications, landowner permissions, etc. So that's what we're working on at the moment. Brilliant. Intent, Councillor Paul. Thank you, thank you, Andy. Councillor Harry, then Councillor Gareth. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's a question for Sarah, first of all. So, Sarah, I think in your presentation, you said that initially there'd be a plan to put the Cleward West bid in for round two. Uh, this council would receive some sort of advice or information that there may not be a round three or we may not be eligible for round three. And therefore, that was what prompted the decision to put the Abba Conway constituency bid in for round two as well. Is is that correct? Uh, council, yes, Councillor Harry. Uh, but we, we, uh, we didn't have firm guidance on whether there would be a round three. Um, so uh, that is why we decided to put all three bids in together in round two. OK, and that decision, I appreciate there will have been work in the background, but that decision formally was taken by Cabinet on the 14th of June 2022, correct? Um, I believe so. I have put all of the timeline in the report. I'm just scrolling through. But if you have that in front of you, yes, that, that what, okay. what I've written in the report is correct, well, yeah. I, I would just then like to understand why in that case we had Jane Richardson, the former strategic director for economy in place, come to our local area forum north, which covers Llandudno, provide an update at the time on the Aberconway bid. Um, as I recall, Jane was very clear that there were concerns about the maturity of the bid. Those are reflected in the minutes of that local area forum, which in turn will have come to economy in place. Um, as I recall it in the meeting, uh, Jane said that she didn't think that the bid would get through round two, but it's going to be submitted anyway, see what the feedback says, and then look to submit it in round three. And the minutes of that local area forum say it would be submitted in round three, albeit with the caveat, if available. But isn't it a bit strange if you and your colleagues and if Cabinet were of the opinion that we probably wouldn't be able to submit in round three, that strategic director came and told the councillors who represented the ward where this particular project be based that there was an aspiration to submit it in round three, even if you understood that was highly unlikely. One of the things that we had been told was that um, there was a possibility that the round three bids would only be available to bids that had already been submitted and had had feedback. So I think that's what Jane was referring to. It, it was okay. very, I have to say, it was very confusing and the goalpost did keep moving. We did not have clarity. But but we had one of the things that we had been told was there is a possibility that round three might only be for previous submitted bid. OK, that is really helpful. And I'd say I think that's the first time that I've heard 
that feedback. Um, I'm conscious in the times this has been raised in this chamber, a number of people have um, raised concerns about advice or information that's been given. Um, I'm not sure that many members have actually seen much of this advice in writing. So I wonder if after this meeting, if written advice that's been received in respect of forbids could be shared, uh, even if it's confidential, even if it's just with local members, if that information could be shared so we can actually have some certainty as to where we stand with this. Uh, uh, yeah, unfortunately, um, Councillor Harry, we were not able to get written advice. Um, I, I will go back and find out if there was any written advice, but the process with uh, getting information uh, from UK government for the levelling up bids has been um, uh, quite difficult. The, the, there's been changes and whenever we've asked for advice, we still have nothing on round three. There are some, uh, we've just started getting some invitations for website, uh, for, sorry, for online uh, events to talk about uh, what to do for submitting to round three but we have not had anything formal from UK government and uh, we have regular conversations with the team, but unfortunately um, there was there was nothing written at any time that I'm aware of. I, I will go back to the team and ask at what stage did we get the formal notifications, but um, generally it was when, when uh, the two budget announcements were made that we, that was the first kind of formal uh, announcement and then, um, the, the news on what comes next has been uh, sporadic and changing and, and not been written down. Uh, Councillor Harry. I think we'll perhaps uh, leave that point there. I, I think it's surprising that um, we're making decisions on really significant uh, regeneration projects based on advice and you'd then be told that we haven't actually had it formally it, it seems a bit bizarre to me frankly if I could ask one question quickly furthermore and and hopefully this is probably a simpler question um I'm looking at paragraph 1.6 in the report where it says that feedback from the applications will be taken on board and that these projects uh will be put forward for potentially other grant funding if needed as and when that becomes available um have any other potential grant funding schemes of the same size been identified that could replace the levelling up uh, grant process, particularly in respect of the Aberconway constituency bid? Um, no, they have not been identified, um, certainly not for the for the full packages that we've put forward. So um, we are looking at um, potential for smaller funding bids. So, for example, through shared prosperity funding, we have uh, been awarded some money towards uh, some of the events infrastructure that was included in the Aberconway bid. But there, at the moment, there aren't any uh, large scale funding packages around that could replace for the for the entirety of the bids we put forwards. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harry. Um, Councillor Paul, I, I've got councillors. Can I just come in on on this this issue because it's, otherwise uh, we'll do. Yeah. Yes, Councillor Gromwe just popped his hand up on this issue. So briefly, both of you, and then. Yeah, I, I would just like to congratulate Andrew and his team on the work they've done with the Coastal Valley project. That was a, the one that was approved, and the work is well in, well underway in developing that project. The only comment I would make about the levelling up funding, this was a shambolic announcement by UK government, a pot of money that was uh, identified, very little um, guidance with it. It was announced that bids had to be in with a matter of months, and then they kept on moving the goalposts. So I would like to thank the officers for all the work they've done in preparing bids in what has been a diff specifically difficult way of apply applying for grant funding. They create an awful lot of for officers and very little sanity around that grant funding, I think. We should be wary when well, when government comes up with pots of money without clear uh, clear deadlines and clear outlines of what is expected to be delivered. Thank you, Councillor Gromit. Councillor Paul, briefly, thank you. Council Councillor Harry knows I'm going to say this. If he wants us to receive written advice from UK government, he needs to lobby his local Conservative MPs to get the UK government to give us the written advice. It's very simple. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Councillor Harry, did you want to come back on that? 
I'll come back on that very briefly. Yes. And I think Paul possibly knows what I'm going to say. And I'm sure there will have been a lot of advice around the levelling up bids. However, the feedback in respect of the Aberconway bit um, is the bit I will touch on. Now, I've repeatedly asked if we can have updates from this council on the bid process so we can be as scrutiny updated. I've asked for those twice in slightly over a year. This is the first time we're discussing it in scrutiny. I did ask for an update to come to the local area forum north. Um, the response that I had was that the chief exec and the leader wouldn't attend because this council hadn't received any feedback, so had nothing to discuss. I actually contacted the uh, relevant government department and they confirmed that this council had had the feedback. So perhaps some clarity around that would be helpful. Thank you, Councillor Harry. Green. Um, thank you, Councillor Harry. And I think you've raised this before and I think we've responded before. I think in respect of the timing of those meetings, there was a, a couple of weeks window where you will appreciate the document we received in terms of feedback needed to be considered internally before anything else. So it was premature to be going to any meeting to discuss that feedback at that time. And I think what we did was reasonable. We have a report here. We are able to bring you a report here that encompasses everything that needs to be done in, or was done in respect of levelling up, including, as you've already heard, the shifting position that, that we found ourselves as officers at the time trying to make decisions when things were changing. Um, and to be fair, I'd, I'd echo the thanks I'd like to give to the, to the officers concerned. Um, it was a very short window of time they had to do this work. And to be fair, the level of uh, bids that were put in were fantastic in those circumstances. And we will take on board the detail that's been provided by um, uh, the, the team in terms of any future uh, bid process. But I think the, the, the what jumps out at that feedback is had we had more time to prepare those those bids, they would have been stronger. And therefore, I, I don't take that as a criticism of the officer's work. I, to be honest, they may, the, the, the miracles were undertaken in that really short period of time. So um, I accept that, that Councillor Harry has asked for an update, but to be fair, I think this is the relevant time because we have all the information now um, apart from round three. And that is the information that we need. But I would give a little bit of, of caution on round three. We've heard already around the pressure we have on our capital programme. Every single bid requires 10% match funding. And we are in a very different place now than we were um, 12 to 18 months ago in terms of our ability to match with our funds. So I, I, I would put that caveat in there. Any, any opening, if there will be, we'll have to have that in the back of our minds. Very briefly, Councillor Harry, and then... Yeah, we'll... it, it is a very brief point. Look, I don't I don't want to monopolise uh, the debate, but just to pick up the point the Chief Exec made about uh, the capital allocation for match funding, and I think it's an important point. I know it has been raised here. Uh, the main private stakeholder involved in the Aberconway bid has offered to work with this council to see if they can provide through one mechanism or another some or all of the funding that would be required to provide that match and that has been communicated in writing to the leader so totally understand that there may be some challenges but i just want to be very clear that that cannot be held up as a roadblock to this and it is something that we may have solutions to work around excellent thank, thank you councillor Howe. we've got councillors gareth nigel and Ant. then we are moving to the recommendations councillor gareth Thanks. Just a just just a couple of questions from me. There was a report came out, I think, last week saying that the active travel, a Wales ride wide report, that the active travel hasn't actually seen any increase in walking, and that the cycling is about the same before they put all the spend into active travel. Just just wondered if there was any implications in that with our spend on the active travel scheme. Is there any learnings? Are we going to have to change it or tweak it? And my second question relates to 3.7 in the report. In the long list, there was it alludes to expenditure on the three paddling pools. And I just wondered, is that the work that we've now actually doing at the moment? 
on the three pools that we've actually found funding from elsewhere to do the work or was that referring to other work that was planned and other schemes that was planned for the pools? Andy, would you like to take this? Thank you. Um, yeah, with regards to the question about increasing active travel use, um, clearly that's a, a long-term aim and, and building infrastructure is, is just part of a package of, of things that we need to do to to increase active travel use um, that it, it doesn't affect the specific the specific projects that that we're working on they will all have um, sort of baseline usage monitoring taken before the projects are built and then for a period of time after the projects are built um, but we we, we completely believe in, in the more in money of Coast to Valley scheme, that it will be a benefit to the community and increase cycling and walking in, in the Conway Valley. Thank you, Andrew. And your second question, Sarah, if you'd like to answer the second part. Yes, thank you. So it did include um, some of, of that work and because we knew it was uh, there was a lot of urgent work that needed undertaking. We were um, also seeking funding elsewhere. We were looking wherever we could, so we had included that. Um, I think, uh, I, I don't think there was additional work for that. I'd have to just go back and check, but I, th I think there was um, exactly the work that we've done now, and uh, we've been able to source other funding, thankfully, for, for making sure that the paddling pools are um, fully refurbished and uh, safe and uh, protected for the, the coming years for our citizens and for the people coming in um, as tourists into the county. Thank you. Thank Councillor Gareth. Yeah, thanks. I just wondered if there was a bigger scheme initially thought of or anything, but yeah, answer's plain. Thank you both. Uh, Councillor Nigel, then Councillor Anne and Dilwyn. Thank you, Chair. Um, to be honest, I just want to say I find it really disappointing the comments coming uh, uh, from the opposition member um, trying to find fault here in in a team of officers that has, I want to echo the chief executive words here, have worked a miracle, a miracle. I see this nothing less than a success, a success story. Um, we've already heard the leader say that, um, you know, we put three schemes forward one of which was successful, a 33% success rate. The average UK was a 25% success rate. Denbyshire only got 10.9 million. We've got 18.6 million. This is great news. It's fantastic. And our officers were under extreme pressure because of this cobbled together, uh, uh, leveling up funding, where the goalposts kept shifting um, information was poor, but despite that, I see it nothing less than a great success. And uh, Councillor Nigel, I, I, I'm just I, I, I'm aghast really with Harry's comments. Um, but there we go. I'd like to move the recommendation that we uh, we note this report. I think it's it shows how how good our officers are and the skill teams that we have, uh, which are obviously headed by Sarah. And uh, I'm very very happy. Thank you. I'm glad you're very happy, Councillor Nigel. That's what we like on a Monday morning. Uh, Councillor Anne and then Dilwyn. A couple, couple of points, Chair, thanks. Um, I mean, Councillor Gareth is, uh, has brought up the passing pools. Um, you, you might be expecting me to ask for, well, what the devil's happening with them? Um, I'm not going to ask that question now, but I would ask the leader and Sarah if they would write particularly, not to all members, but particularly to those members in whose wards these paddling pools have been an absolutely um, catastrophe and sort of a, a public sort of humiliation, really. I mean, I think it's probably been about, I don't know, six, eight weeks ago, if not longer, um, since I found out direct um, from source in terms of what was happening with the paddling pools. And obviously six, eight weeks later, I haven't a Scooby-Doo in terms of 
what's holding up completion, when completion will be, um, and so on. So I would actually ask the leader and Sarah to put the heads together and give members and indeed the public um, an update on where it's going. Obviously this week the schools are back and you know that has been a, a, a real um, own goal in terms of not completing the paddling pools and opening them while, while the kids were, were off school. So I just asked for a report. But back to this report, um, my, my sort of, I, I understand that, you know, these these bids are were coming at with little information, very short time scales, and obviously we're about attracting significant amounts of investment. Um, so, you know, what we've, what we've achieved is great. Um, and obviously we've talked here about the learning, um, but I wonder what, what learning is there around the prioritization process? Because um, I can see within the report and it's been mentioned, we're looking at a great on visitor center and yet more investment in venue Cymru. Um, and I don't understand where that prioritization has come from, um, because obviously this is quite a widespread geographical council with rurality as well as coastal communities and obviously remote um, east and west um, outliers. And I don't understand um, my opportunity to be involved um, in the prioritization process. I understand that there will have been reports gone to economy in place, but that's about the projects that were being put forward. So my question is, um, how do we involve scrutiny and wider membership in the prioritization, prioritization process? And actually, could we have a database um, uh, evidence based priorities options so that you know off the shelf or on the shelf um, uh, pro projects are there and actually we've had input into what we actually want to see happen across our county um, I think that's really important and that's a big piece that I've taken from this report I don't feel included in the process in fact I don't even understand what the prioritization process is so thanks chair thank you for those points councillor Anne Oh, Councillor Adam, do you want to respond to that? Before? Just on the paddling pools, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, we are investing in the county's four paddling pools, uh, and uh, Sarah and I will try and meet with local members, uh, hopefully this week or at least uh, next week. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Could I have an answer about prioritisation as well, Chair? Yes, you could. Who's good? Councillor Charlie, are you going to answer? Um, yeah, and you make a very valid point. I mean, we've commented on how tight the time scales were for these applications. Um, it was a whole new funding source. It was just thrown out there and you had to put your bids in. There's 600 odd bids which have failed. That's a considerable amount of public money where people have worked bids up at pace and scale to, to kind of deliver. So that's a real concern. If you look at um, 3.27, it talks about previous funding schemes, which was more an expression of interest. And you could work with the funder and you had time to actually bring the sword something that would be more meaningful. You have more time to spend the money. Um, so I absolutely hope they do look at this again, or whoever's bringing forward replacements for European funding, it needs to be done better and it needs to be on a, on a longer time scale so you can make meaningful change and involve local members and make sure there is that distribution throughout the council. But when, you, when you're working the deadlines as tight as these, that's not possible. And again, like everybody else, I'd absolutely like to add my thanks to your officers who were successful. Uh, there's many places where, there, where, where there's no investment at all. So thank you. Th thanks, Leader. Sarah, do you want to come back in briefly before we go? To yeah, very question? briefly, just to add to the complications of this uh, this particular strand of funding, um, we had to get uh, the MPs to agree to our funding bids. So um, we we had, as I mentioned in the report, we had to have lots of conversations with both Robin Miller and David Jones. Um, around what they would like to see within the bid. So it was a slightly uh, different uh, process than one that we would uh, normally undertake. Um, and as I mentioned in the report, we did do a long list, which then came through uh, democracy, I think is the, the short list in the end. Um, but um, I, I, I hear what uh, Councillor Anne is saying as well. Thank you very much, Sarah. Last, Councillor Dillwyn, before we move to the recommendations. Um, Good morning, members of Stephen Gladi. Stephen Gladi, I am a Move, it's closer. She can't hear. Oh, 
Mae gen i nai wedi isio cymryd y cyfle yma long gyfer pawb sydd bod yn ymwneud efo hwn. Mae'n waith arbennig o dda mewn amser byr. A mi wedi rhaid oedd hynny achos oedd yma, ac bod o'n byd i wneud o'r gyd o'n i'n mymar y pryd. Ac mae gen i un cwestiwn yn sydyn wrth dod o'n gyfarch di Andrew hefyd o fyn. Dwi'n meddwl os dwi'n cofio newn ar chi ddweud y byddai'n gyfarfod hefo'r cyhoedd yn ardal y trycoed yn y dyfodol agos. Gyna chi rhwys yn iad pryd mewn nhw'n ddi fod? Diolch cynghorio dilwyn. Bydd na gyfarfod efo parc yn edlaethol yr yrru ar y ddeunawfed o mis Mnedi. No translation, sir. That's my big moment. <laughs> well done, Andrew. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, uh, so there's, there's a meeting with the National Park on the 18th of this month. We're following that with uh, a briefing for local members on the 28th, which I think you've been invited to. And then we'll see what comes out of that meeting with, with the National Park. And then hopefully it will be in October, we'll have um, uh, a meeting in Betsacoy to brief people on progress. Okay, thank you very much everyone for all those questions and thanks again to Sarah and the team for, and Andrew and the team for all they've been doing. Uh, we will now move to, we've had um, a proposal from Councillor Nigel 2.1 that we note the decision. Have we a second if that please? Councillor Stephen. Okay, could we all members show, please? One, two, three, four, five, six. And online. Get this right, gentlemen. One, two. Eight. And six in the room eight on a line anybody against anyone abstain no that's carried thank you very much indeed five pounds in the chairs charity there andrew <laughs> okay we now let's have a look here uh we now move um as per my previous comments, I'll now hand over the chair to Councillor Dilwyn for this next item, the development of 3G pitch at Park Areas and Notice of Motion. I'm doing this because I was involved in uh, the um, questions to full council on the 27th and wish to uh, take full part in this debate. So thank you very much, Councillor Dilwyn. Um, yn fatar bwysiad, dwi'n gwybod pwys i di, pwys yn dod i fewn i, dwi'n cymryd na'ch di ar ond, sy'n mynd i rhoi'r cynnig o'n blaen anni, so mae rhoi dros oli ti o'n ar ond, diolch mor iawn ti. Diolch mor iawn, Dylwyn. Nes iawn dweud i'n y gadar. I'm going to take us uh, through this report, uh, and I'll be focusing on the uh, 3G pitch itself, uh, before handing over to Amanda, strategic director who will take us through the decision-making process. Um, and then, Chair, we'll uh, open up to floor. Uh, so the grass pitch at Stadium CSM has been replaced with a state-of-the-art 3G pitch. The former grass pitch only allowed for around 10 hours of use per week, of which RGC took up most, if not all, of this allocated time. The CG pitch will now allow us to have more sporting and music events on site, as well as additional opportunities for the local community and local groups to use. And this is really important, in my opinion. Uh, as you can see from 1.7 in the report, the uh, Welsh Rugby Union have expressed their delight with the new pitch following the first RGC game on the 12th of August. The North Wales Crusaders, the local uh, rugby league team, who are now also based at Stadium CSM, 
have played their first match on the 27th of August, which I'm delighted to report was a resounding 62-20 win against the London Scholars. The business case that was reported by members last year is a spend to save business case. The 3G pitch will require less maintenance and will generate additional income for the service from increased use of the facility. Therefore, there is no additional burden on the council's revenue budget or to our residents or to the taxpayer. The pitch is to be paid for by the additional revenue raised and the savings made due to less maintenance. Not only does this not impose a burden on the council's revenue budget, it will in fact generate savings of at least £300,000 over the lifetime of the asset. This will certainly support the leisure service budget and the whole of the economy and culture service going forward. I'd also like to highlight here that the council were very fortunate in receiving a £110,000 grant, which is not to be paid back from the Welsh Rugby Union. And I'd like to thank the WRU for this very generous grant which I believe is the largest grant the union has ever awarded any organisation. The new 3G pitch at Stadium CSM will allow us to host and promote elite rugby in conjunction with the WRU. In doing so, this allows for professional training camps and matches and the promotion and expansion of the women's game. And I'm delighted to announce that the international matches are to return to Stadium CSM. At the end of this month, the stadium will host Wales women versus USA women, and tickets are now available at the box office. Put the number up on the screen. <laughs> uh, as I've uh, already mentioned, the business case that was approved by members last year demonstrates that the new 3G pitch will generate savings of at least £300,000 over the lifetime of the asset, and there is no additional burden on our revenue budget. It's important to recognise that the decisions taken over recent years to invest in leisure facilities has directly led to increased FIT Conway membership. Not only does this generate additional income for the council, it also helps us to achieve our corporate priority of keeping the people of Conway active and healthy. Our FIT Conway membership has well surpassed pre-pandemic levels, and we have more FIT Conway members now than ever before. And I'd like to thank the principal leisure manager, Mali Tidswell, and Sarah Acup, uh, Head of Service, and their excellent team for all their hard work. We must remember that this great achievement has been reached despite the budget pressures faced by us and the public. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Amanda to take us through the decision-making process. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, so just, just to confirm then the decision-making process. So I, I'll just uh, go back slightly to the extent of talking about the uh, levelling up bid, because obviously it was, it was in, in that context. So, so um, prior to um, the decision or, or effectively the, the, the change in the rules on the levelling up, which allowed our bid to be, our Cluid West bid to, to, to be changed from that 10 million bid to that 20 million bid. So aside and away from that, uh, we were already, or leisure services were already in discussion uh, with the Welsh Rugby Union about the development of the 3G pitch uh, there, because um, you'll see actually in the in the quotes uh, later on in the report uh, from, from the uh, Welsh Rugby Union, they were actually starting to move away from uh, um, areas because the facility wasn't in good condition uh, and wasn't that usable for them and and actually so therefore a discussion had already started with them uh, about getting a state-of-the-art uh, pitch uh, elite sport pitch uh, in in Colwyn Bay to allow them to to obviously stay and develop as well as bringing those community benefits uh, to us uh, as, a, as an authority. Um, so um, that was already going on alongside. Uh, we then had the, the, the scenario where uh, our levelling up bid uh, was going to change, so we were going to submit this bigger bid, and therefore that required uh, us to provide that additional match from the million pound to match the 10 or the 9 million in the first bit to, to effectively 2 million being required uh, for, the, for the 20 million. So in a way it worked out conveniently in that sense that we had an we had a uh, a scheme which was allied to the development uh, that we were proposing for the leveling up bid uh, in the 3G pitch to in a way create that match then uh, for 
that extra million pound without us therefore having to identify more funding because we we already had that scheme there and the other bit was the running track uh, where we already had within the capital budget there was already 250,000 set aside uh, for the running track so so the development of the 3G pitch and the running track capital budget that was already existed effectively created the match for the bid um so um because effectively we were adding an, uh, a million pound of, of our funding into uh, the levelling up bid, that obviously required then a, a council decision. Uh, as you're full, fully aware, uh, the constitution says that any addition to the capital uh, programme where it's effectively requiring our funds to be matched or, or our funds to be provided, anything above uh, half a million pound is a council decision. So a report was brought to council on the 14th of July to uh, seek uh, the addition to the capital budget, uh, which brought in uh, the 3G pitch scheme um, in, into the capital budget uh, with an identified funding, which was, which, which was effectively that, that uh, uh, investor save funding of supported borrowing, which could be funded through reduced maintenance cost and increased income. The business case to support uh, the, the, uh, that self-financing of the 3G pitch was set out in that council report uh, in paragraph 3.7 and effectively uh, the resolution there on the back of uh, that council meeting, the resolution was to add uh, the athletic track, the 3G athletic track with its source of funding being supported borrowing, uh, adding that to the capital programme uh, and therefore um, you know, uh, the decision effectively give, gave lawful uh, authority for officers to continue uh, with that scheme uh, because the uh, it was added to the programme on the back of a, a supported business case and the funding was identified. I appreciate it was connected to the levelling up bid, but the uh, important thing in that was that the Arias Park uh, pitch uh, and the athletics track were not contingent on the success of the levelling up bid, i.e. the funding was already identified. The funding did not require the grant, the external grant. Uh, the it, it required the self-financing uh, supported borrowing. Uh, and in the case of the athletics track, it was already in the capital programme. So the authority, therefore, to continue with the scheme from the officer's point of view uh, was legitimate and made on that decision uh, in the, at that council meeting on the 14th of July. And I certainly, as a Section 151 officer, and I've consulted with the monitoring officer, uh, and we are both comfortable uh, that the correct process was followed and the decision on the 14th of July gave officers uh, that lawful authority because the, the uh, track uh, was added into the capital budget at that point uh, with a funding source identified and approved by council. Uh, thank you. Just just to add, my apology. Uh, just further, actually, just going on to the business case and not to take away from uh, what uh, Concarrie Aaron has already said. Uh, but I would also just uh, critically point out. I think it's useful to say that that you know the maintenance budget, the reduction in the maintenance budget, and the increased income could not have happened without the new pitch. In other words, the the reason I make that point is that that money couldn't have been diverted elsewhere to support other spending within the within the council budget and i think that's that's critical to point out because because effectively it demonstrates ultimately the 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 absolute validity of of the business case because the 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 savings generated and the additional income generated effectively can only happen as a result of the installation of the pitch uh, and and i just want to make that as an, an additional critical point thank you hey, uh, go Diolch, diolch efo rhawn i'r ddain a chi y cyflwyniad manwl yn awan sydd wedi eu clyro llawer o bethau uh, diolch lawr. Uh, Councillor Cheryl, you've asked to come in first on this. Diolch, Councillor Dilwyn. Um, and thank you very much to Councillors, uh, Councillor Aaron and Amanda for that. Um, unfortunately, this report has not answered the questions, this report before has not answered the questions I raised in Council on the 27th of July regarding transparent governance, financial due diligence and transparent democracy. 
I've got five questions. Um, it would have been helpful if the five questions uh, I put during that council meeting that was deferred. It would have been really helpful if those five questions had been in the report, but I will reiterate them in a more simplified uh, manner for today. My first question, Councillor Aaron, where is the spend to save business case you rely so heavily on? Where is your costs evaluations? Where is the this is where the interest is going to be. This is how much we're going to have for the pitch. Where are all those figures saying how much, you know, your maintenance contracts, where is that spend to save business case you talk about right. repeatedly? If I could, if you could answer Do you want to please. respond to that either of you now? We'll take each point one by one. Uh, yes, um, it was presented to council uh, in July last year and it's uh, in the appendix uh, for this report. No, no, the actual, the internal document or should have, the document should have come to scrutiny, laying out all your finances regarding this, what you're currently paying, what you intend to pay in the future, where all the additional incomes from, a proper spend to save business case, because you talk about it all the time, that was just a large general business case you put forward, didn't have any figures in whatsoever, so I'm asking you, where is the case that you presented that, that, that you based all your um, recommendations on. So thank you. Amanda, do you want to come in? Now? Yeah, the, the, the business case uh, was set out in the uh, council report. I appreciate it wasn't set out in the level of detail that you're referring to there, uh, Councillor Cheryl, but, but I, would, I, would, uh, I would say that there are lots of business cases that come to in front of the council where, where, where decisions are taken which do not have the depth of detail you were talking about we just earlier on this morning there was a business case for two hundred and fifty thousand pounds to support the oas project uh you know the detail you've just referenced wasn't included in that there was there's nothing in our constitution that sets out the, that you know a lengthy several page document needs to come the the business case in in terms of it it demonstrating that it was a spend to save with reduced maintenance costs and increased income which which was questioned uh, at full council at the time uh, and the vote was unanimous to support that so uh, you know there's nothing in the constitution that requires a lengthy document to come to scrutiny the the business case in terms of the justification for it was it was in the council report yeah i i absolutely get that amanda and um, yeah it's it's where is your document with all these figures where where, where is that well, the the appendix um, the appendix attached to the report today gives you gives you all of that detail. The business case, obviously, I, I mean, in fact, obviously, at the time uh, the costings were done last in July, interest rates would have actually been lower, uh, and therefore the business case would have st stacked up even more at that point. The 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 business case is. There was no effect. I, you know, I accept there was no official document, uh, but there was there were costings done between finance and the leisure services, which demonstrated uh, that that the business case stacked up, and that was what we reflected in the July council report. Can you move to the second yeah, part certainly, now? Second certainly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who decided to repurpose the levelling up match funding? And where is the clear audit trail of this? The council report of 14th July 2022 is all based on the successful levelling up fund bid. Nowhere in there does it say, if this bid fails, we will spend the 750000 anyway. So I'm just wondering what the audit trail of Councillor Aaron could maybe let me know how we moved from where we were in in full council the leveling up bid failed but you decided to do it anyway that would be really helpful in the second question thank you does anybody want to answer that um yeah so so as i, as I explained in uh, when i was just talking through the decision the 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 council decision effectively provided provided you know recognized the the addition to the capital program in terms of the spend and the addition to the capital program in terms of the supported borrowing uh, to finance the area scheme. So, so whilst I appreciate um, it was connected with a levelling up bid, the, the 3G pitch and the supported borrowing was not contingent upon the success of the levelling up bid because it didn't need the grant funding. The, the funding was identified because the supported borrowing was what was going to finance the 3G pitch. And the addition to the capital programme in July added in both the spend and the supported borrowing. And therefore, it's sort of academic in a way, the, the levelling up bid, because we didn't need the grant funding for that element to 
continue because it was self-financing and had been approved and the decision to put it into the capital program uh, with the supported borrowing gave the lawful authority to continue with that element of the scheme. Thank you, man. I mean, I can't find anywhere in this document where it says that. This is uh, July last year. Okay, um, question three, please. How and by whom was it decided to then spend the 250,000 earmarked for replacing the athletics track on the 3G pitch? And I now gather that this 250K is still sitting in the budget somewhere. I'm, I'm really confused on that. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so so effectively, the the pitch would have come in. Uh, sorry, my apologies, not the pitch. Um, the 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 athletics track, the two hundred and fifty thousand for the athletics track was already in the capital program uh, in twenty two twenty three, um, and would have been. I'd have to go back. Apologies, I, I haven't done that, but I would have to go back to find out when that came into the capital program. But I'm assuming it came in, it maybe even in twenty one, twenty two, or twenty two, twenty three via the capital. Uh, the normal capital programme process. Uh, it was in the capital programme already in 22-23 and therefore was, as, a, as I say, usefully used as a, as a match without actually needing additional, additional funding to be identified. The, because of the uh, implementation of the pitch, the, the track hasn't yet continued, but that budget still remains in the capital programme. So it's still there? Still there and obviously can potentially be reprioritized or, or maintained, whichever uh, following our review uh, that's coming forward. Fourth, um, why wasn't this massive spend? I mean, it's clearly equivalent to over 1% in council tax referred back to any other form of scrutiny or governance. Even small amounts come back for variation. And I think it was Councillor Louise that that said at the last, at the previous frosk, would we have approved this spend if it had come for us like that? I'm just asking, did these spends go to a capital programme board, informal cabinet, opportunities board, SLT, project board? I know you've got a dedicated project board for repair and maintenance and leisure. Did, did this pivot go to any of those? And why didn't it come, given the, the amount, uh, why didn't it come back to full council? Thanks, Amanda. Um, the the as I say the once the amount was in the capital program uh, that gave uh, officers lawful authority to move forward with that scheme. Um, you know we we have uh, you know many 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 schemes within our capital program uh, that are over half a million pound in spend and they don't all come back uh, to um, committee on a regular basis unless there's unless there's reason for that so it would have been contained uh, overarchingly within the capital monitoring reports um i'm sure maybe sarah can confirm because I, I i i don't attend the leisure uh, our, uh capital spend board um personally so i don't know for definite but i'm assuming it would have been part of the discussions at, at that board um but but effectively because it was in the capital program it would have it would have been being monitored in accordance with any other of the capital schemes within the capital capital program, it wouldn't have needed or required special attention. Okay. Thank you. And my final question is to you and to Councillor Charlie. Do you feel that all this met our financial standing orders? You, you, you're, you're comfortable, both of you, that that moving these monies around like this meets our financial standing orders. Thank you, Councillor Charlie, leader. Um, I take the opinion of our section 151 officers and uh, it's a yes in terms of what she's set out in front of you, Chair. Um, yeah, as, as I say, um, you know, on the 14th of July 2022, uh, Council um, uh, unanimously approved uh, for the addition to the capital programme, uh, which included uh, the Arius uh, 3G pitch uh, to be supported or to be funded from supported borrowing um, that received full support and that gave uh, lawful authority for good office, for officers to continue with that scheme in good faith. Uh, as I say, I've also consulted uh, separately with the monitoring officer uh, to confirm um, you know, whether he had a different opinion to me uh, or not uh, and he also uh, is is of that view. I'm obviously not to speak for him on his behalf. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm confident that we have complied with our contract. Uh, sorry, our our standing orders. 
Thank you very much. There we are. That's me done. Thank you. We've got our fellow clarifications, Amanda. Uh, next question, Councillor uh, Tom Montgomery, please. Can you hear me online? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks for letting me speak. Apologies, I've got to shoot off very shortly for another meeting. Uh, I just want to say that I, I share Cheryl's view on this. I'm, I'm, I'm really shocked that we can say that the vote that we took last year approved this, this, this spend. That that report was not clear in 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 saying that we were writing a blank check for park for park areas to be uh, to get this 3G pitch, irrespective of how the leveling up. Uh, grant came through or not? Uh, it was my understanding from reading that report that that, that we we were talking exclusively about the leveling up bid, and it's very different to see a three G pitch installed as a part of a twenty million pound funding program opposed to the pitch done by itself. But anyway, I'll leave that point there. I I, I wanted to pick up on Cheryl's first point about the clearer financial image of how we get this pitch to stack up financially. Uh, so I've had. A little bit of experience in uh, 3G pitches uh, with supporting Standard North F Football Club with getting their 3G pitch relayed, and I just had some some questions based on that because in the report it says that the pitch could last 20 years, and then the finances talk about it lasting 15. In all of the contractors that the football club have spoke to about relaying its pitch, no one has ever said under any circumstances they would give a warranty of it lasting 15 years. The football club is now building its business case for the pitch to last seven years because that's how long our first pitch has lasted. So I, I I just feel like we need some clarification on that and where that time frame has come from. Because like I said, ours, well, Flandern of Football Clubs lasted seven years and that was using it for an average of five hours a day. This report talks about it lasting 15 and using 10 hours a day. So I'm, 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 a, bit, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit perplexed by that and I could really do with something in writing. From uh, from the company that has installed the pitch to to back up where where, where fifteen years has come from because I'm staggered by that. Uh, I then wondered how we got to the three hundred thousand pound saving over the fifteen years, assuming it lasts that 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 fifteen year time. Uh, perhaps you can help me a bit more with the figures there uh, because a part of your maintenance saving comes out roughly to you're going to spend about 15k a year on maintenance so for the, going back to the football club again five thousand pounds of that goes straight away to the maintenance contractor that comes in and does the tests you then have to do an hour of maintenance for every 10 hours you use the pitch so you're doing an hour worth of staff time every, every single day according to this report it then doesn't appear that you factored in purchasing the equipment to do the maintenance uh you then talk about the pitch being licensed by the FAW uh, to a FIFA standard and the Welsh Ro Rugby Union. I know that for the Football Association, the Football Association alone, getting that license is two and a half thousand pound, and you need to do that every three years. And that's assuming you pass it with flying colours. Uh, I, ca I can't see that in there. And then also, you don't, from what I can see, factor in one-off repairs. So again, going back to Flandred North Football Club, the nearest 3G pitch that I'm aware of that, that is used for similar levels, for, for similar sports, they've spent about £40,000 over seven years doing one-off repairs for the high usage areas. I, I don't see any of that in the financial an analysis that you've given in this report. And that's why I think uh, Cheryl was trying to touch on, that there's some real concerns that this isn't going to stack up. And you know when it comes to relaying the pitch, in in fifteen years, is 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 there a budget for that? Because I think it's going to be around two hundred thousand pound. So if you haven't budgeted for that, that three hundred net saving has suddenly gone down to one hundred without all of the other points I've just touched on. Sorry, I know there was a lot of figures thrown out there, but Fine. I'm just re really concerned that that without a proper financial analysis, this isn't actually going to stack up, and we're going to end up with a pitch there that you. can't be used. I'll ask the officers to come in to respond to the point you made. Thank you, Councillor. Dumni Lord, Ivan Ilakhra Dewin. I just want to, um, uh, I disagree with the point Councillor Montgomery made about writing a blank cheque. Uh, there was a clear amount that we've asked for uh, from the capital programme, so it wasn't a blank cheque. I don't agree with that at all. Um, I agree, yes, we are going for FIFA standards so we can have uh, matches on there. Uh, including uh, the rugby. 
And as you can see from the report, we are paying uh, at the moment £61,000 a year to maintain the grass pitch. Uh, and going forward, they will be less expensive. Uh, Amanda, if I hand over to you to talk about the 300000 of course. Um, ju just uh, just uh, to touch on uh, the maintenance as, as well. So, um, so uh, the 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 manufacturers have, have effectively confirmed that the pitch is obviously subject to how well you maintain it. Uh, the pitch uh, could potentially last up uh, to twenty years. Now, obviously, we don't believe uh, that would be a sensible uh, time frame to go over. Uh, the reason uh, fifteen years uh, as 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 been gone for is that we're confident and I say we uh, I, I talk on behalf of of uh, Mally Tidswell the uh, leisure manager uh, is confident uh, that the pitch can be maintained uh, effectively and to last a 15 year period and the reason we're confident of that is because um, uh, we are uh, maintaining it in accordance with um, the manufacturer and uh, consultant's advice about how to maintain it. Uh, we are well versed uh, already in good practice on maintaining pitches. And in fact, uh, we have uh, a clear example of that already. The barn uh, 3G pitch is now 12 years old and is still in good working order, having been maintained regularly in accordance with standards, as is the other pitch. Uh, at areas. Um, I think it is naive to say a pitch can only last as long as a warranty. We all have cars that have three-year warranties on. I think you're still driving them uh, beyond three years. Uh, the warranty is just a time frame that uh, a manufacturer will uh, continue to 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 guarantee something. So uh, it is. We are uh, responsible certainly for uh, ensuring that we maintain effective maintenance to 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 get that life. And clearly, uh, Leisure are well practiced in it. As I say. They are clear about how to do it. Uh, they're doing it in accordance with standards and they have experience and and uh, proof existing of, of being able to maintain pitches appropriately for a long period of time. I think perhaps it's uh, not necessarily appropriate to, to, to uh, compare it to a pitch uh, at, at another club. Um, the standard and quality of the pitches uh, may well differ. Uh, something that was installed a number of years ago isn't necessarily akin to something that's been installed today. It's a we we've gone for a pitch that is of uh, elite sport quality, uh, very high quality, and I and I, and I would guess is not a like for like comparison uh, with the the pitch that uh, the council is referring to. Uh, in terms of the uh, business case, uh, that set out. Uh, the detail is set out in Appendix uh, 2. Um, just bear with me while I ever so quickly open it up. Um, but effectively, the maintenance costs that uh, are being put forward here uh, is, um, well, uh, reduced reduced down from 60000 to about £15,000 a year. The £15,000 a year uh, that, that's been included is to uh, incur £6,000 a year uh, for um, decompacting, uh, maintaining the fibres uh, on the pitch. Uh, the, the test uh, to ensure, the annual test to ensure that it still meets uh, FIFA and WIU standards, and, and actually more importantly than meeting FIFA and WIU standards, maintain it effectively for safety. That's a test that makes sure that it's still, you know, absolutely level, that it doesn't have any um, unforeseen dents or, 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 or divots in it or whatever that are going to cause injury or whatever. That's a test that we will do annually and will cost £1,400 a year. Um, the uh, equipment you reference, um, uh, we already have, uh, and uh, including uh, a tractor which has been port purchased as part of the of the um, uh, of the uh, implementation of, of the pitch as it is, uh, and and those costs effectively uh, uh, or maintenance of that tractor should I say comes to two hundred fifty pound, and so they come to seven seven fifty. 
there isn't actually a requirement for additional staff time because we already have the staff uh, to do uh, the drag brushing uh, that is needed on a regular basis uh, and and quite a bit of their time has been freed up by the fact or will be freed up by the fact that they're not going to have to be continually moving uh, the posts between football posts and rugby posts uh, between the pitches as they currently are now uh, they can leave them uh, set up but nonetheless uh, we have also included uh, within the maintenance costs uh, a, a provision of around seven and a half thousand pound per year uh, to fund additional uh, overtime uh, at uh, recognizing that there may be some pressurized peak points of busyness where we might have to get them to do additional work so that's what makes up the uh, maintenance uh, budget that's foreseen uh, in relation to uh, the project so so um Therefore, we are saving about £45,000 a year in maintenance costs. Um, the additional income that's been recognised in the uh, in the business case or in the in the analysis uh, that's in Appendix 2, we already now this year have attracted that additional income. Uh, so that's, all, that's a prudent estimate of the additional income that we believe the pitch can generate. And that is just purely reflecting the additional income that we have already secured from the WIU uh, for the expansion in, in the use of the facility that they are doing uh, in promoting and developing the women's game uh, in North Wales. Um, the actual income we are likely to get, we believe, will be significantly higher than £34,000 because we haven't yet taken account of all the additional community income that we'll get from clubs, uh, sporting groups, other facilities um, uh, of both uh, the the uh, other pitch plus uh, the 3G pitch. Bear in mind the 3G pitch isn't just there for the WIU. Certainly the WIU and the Crusaders will be using it a lot, but so will uh, others, uh, our schools, uh, our community groups, etc. So, so the, there's plenty scope uh, for more additional income. But even based on uh, the additional income already secured of thirty-four thousand pound a year, the reduced uh, uh, maintenance costs of forty-five thousand pound a year, that already uh, covers uh, the interest rate charges um, uh, at the current interest rates now. So, bear in mind, uh, had a business case, or had you seen these detailed costings uh, last July, then then the figures would have actually been higher because at that point uh, interest was probably uh, only at about four or four and a half percent. So. Um, um, you know, already uh, it take, it's been this business case, or oh, sorry, this analysis, financial analysis has been brought up to date uh, to the current rate. Uh, and it's got at the moment an assumption of six and a half percent in in there, which is the five. Uh, I think I think interest rates currently are 5.25. They're expected to go up to 5.5. And we generally have to pay about a percent above uh, the base rate. So that's why six and a half percent has been used in here. So, as I say, you can see in the analysis uh, that over the 15 year period, um, we will actually generate uh, a additionally or net savings of 299,000 and actually as i say it, it will be more than that because there will be uh, a higher level of income than we've assumed in in this analysis um i hope and i think that covers all of the points that you raised thank you uh, i'm sure that's covered all your points there has it so yeah it has responded to them yeah chair but it, it was more the fact that I kind of expected at, at this level in this report we would be getting all of that detail explaining and put and and and, and putting in writing that the contractor thinks yeah, that it can last that long so if 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 I could have that Amanda followed up in writing that would be very useful thank you okay there we are thank you John uh councillor Louise uh thank you chair and uh, thank you for letting me speak because I also have to go soon. I think Amanda just uh, nailed it really when she said, had we seen the costings last July? That's why we're here today. And the only reason that we've got this on the agenda today is because the Conservative Group's notice of motion. Had we seen all the costings in a proper spend to save business case last July, maybe attached to the 14th of July, which said, if we don't get the bid, we're going to do this, then then I think we wouldn't be here today. Uh, we would have had that debate uh, as part of that levelling up bid thing. So there's there's the crux of the problem. You're never going to convince me that you had lawful authority from last July, which is why I think it's important that somebody else decides uh, with the word audit in the title whether whether you did have lawful authority to do what you've done. 
based on that 14th of July report last year. But I just want to stick up for the athletics community because in all of this, basically what's happened is you've taken the 250,000 and you've used it on the rugby pitch. And in Aaron's opening speech, there was not even an apology to the athletics community. That's what's happened. So it was myself that agreed to that spend and it was 21-22 as part of the overall repair and maintenance. And of course, the athletics community and everybody that uses the track were delighted, got delayed because of the pandemic. No one in the council, officer or political leader has had the guts and the decency to pick up the phone or send an email to the athletics community to tell them they've taken their 250 and they're putting it into the pitch. No one. That's not how we treat our community groups. No one has involved them in that decision to let them know, you're not getting your track again. Sorry, guys, we're going to do a rugby pitch instead. And I find that pretty disgraceful. So I want to ask why that hasn't happened. And I want to stick up for the athletics community. You say you've, you, a minute ago, you've given the 250 and now you're saying the 250 is still in the capital programme. So I'm really confused about that. I'm sure you can say to me now you're going to apply for more funding. Um, but, you know, that's a real disgrace. Can I have a question as to why the athletics community haven't been contacted? Um, I know the leader wants to come in and I know Amanda, it's up to you. Who can, uh, can, I, can I respond? Can I respond, please, uh, Chair? Um, yes, uh, I, uh, that is not correct at all, uh, Councillor Louise. Um, the athletic track is still in the capital programme. Uh, it's been delayed because we we're doing work on the pitch, but the work on the track will continue. But I thought that's where we've got the 250 for the 720 for the no, rugby pitch. It, what, what members agreed last year was an addition to the capital programme. There we are. So I think that's been clarified. Uh, um, Councillor Nigel. Thank you, uh, Dylan. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, again, yeah, what can I say about the opposition? I'm just really disappointed. Uh, we've already heard from the strategic director of Section 151 officer that happy that all due processes have been carried out. We've heard that there's a £110,000 grant uh, has been received from the WRU, the largest grant possibly in Wales that's ever been given. That shows their confidence in what we are doing in Conway. And I think, you know, uh, for a, uh, an asset that will be used by elite sport, our wider public, our, and our even our school children, we should be very, very proud. I think we were blessed uh, in my early days on the council to have John Hardy, who had a vision um, to equal out elite sport uh, in Conway or in North Wales to that in South Wales. And that mantle has been carried on by Mally Tidswell and very well done indeed. I fully support Mally in this. I think he's doing a great job, him and his team, finding this funding from within their budget, which basically, um, you know, is going to bring 9.1, sorry, £915,000 savings over the 15 years. You know, even compared um, with the maintenance costs that uh, um, Councillor Montague has mentioned, £2,000 a year, um, you know, there's a substantial saving here over the 15 years and I can't see it as anything but a spend to save and I think our asset is in the right hands it's being managed very very well and we've got something here that we'll be able to use long into the future thank you Chair thank you for that Nigel dear Clark leader uh, dear um, I entirely agree with Nigel, we bandy this word transformation around a lot, but this is a really good example of how we can transform our services. We're providing better facilities, we're cutting our costs, we're increasing the health and, and well-being of members of our communities. It's absolutely what we should be doing. What I find very surprising is the Conservative members here, if it was paid for by Sherpa Prosperity Fund, they're quite happy with that, that's fine. There was no questions asked then about the probity of what is taxpayers' money. So I do, I do not understand where you're coming from. If the UK government was paid for it, it's all fine. If we're using money, which is commonly residents' taxpayers' money, it's not fine. Now, that makes no sense. Taxpayers' money is taxpayers' money, and it should be spent properly 
and was probity. And I absolutely feel that this has demonstrated that we do do that. But we need to move forward. We just can't sit still. What's very true, you know, to ask for a report to come to scrutiny, fair enough. To call a special council meeting when you already knew a report was coming to scrutiny, when you already knew the audit of, audit office had been notified, there was absolutely no point in that meeting. And that's what wastes taxpayers' money. We had senior officers here. We had to uh, cancel the Climate Challenge Board, 16 senior officers, six councillors. That hasn't been able to be re rearranged until the end of this month. So there are consequences for that. But yeah, your, your discard for a shared prosperity taxpayers' funds compared to what you're saying now seems very, very strange. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Harry, and I'm sure um, that uh, questions have already been answered will be re asked now for us to get the go forward with where we are. So thank you, Harry. And I wasn't getting at you. Uh, no, 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 Mr. not Chair. at all. But Mr. if it if it helps, Chair, so there were three questions I wanted to yeah, ask. Great. The first one. There have already been some similar questions asked, but the specific bit of detail I would like has been provided. So I'll crack on with that, and then the, the other two haven't been touched. But I'll, I'll put the question to the leader, particularly in light of the comments he's just made. Looking back at the report from the 14th of July, where specifically does it say that there is approval for this pitch to take place separate from the levelling up fund project? The lead has been very clear about financial property, so perhaps he can direct me to the specific paragraph. Um, I, I can't give you that detail at the moment, Harry. I mean, where is the principle here? Is the principle of us bringing forward schemes that save our residents' money and improves their facilities, or is the principle about arguing over what, what, what paragraph on the 14th of July there is there? I mean, it's crazy. If, 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 it was, if these schemes... We're always going to go ahead. They were put to one side as match funding for a bigger prize. But the actual principle and the value of them and the fact that we should be doing them remains the same. So I, I don't really get your point. Well, the point, the point I was getting at, and I think the leader's just made comments about financial probity. I've asked him, where was this agreed? And he's just said he can't answer the question. That, frankly, is not good enough for the leader of the principal um, Sorry, I think our section one I think our section one five officers covered this at length. Okay. So I would refer to the section one five officers report. There we are. Uh, did you have one other point you wanted to There were there were two more. But two I, more. There we I, I still and I okay fine happy for the section one five one officer to answer that first question. But which part of that original report includes that detail? Which part? I mean a paragraph number would be helpful. I'm not expecting uh, you know, repetition of uh, prose, but you know, if you can just give me the paragraph number. Okay, well, just in that context, the the recommendation on the fourteenth uh, of July report was that the council approves the variation to the capital program twenty two twenty three and the proposed funding source. That was the recommendation in two point one, and in table three point six, it expressly shows that the funding source of the additional million pound is. 650,000 unsupported borrowing to be funded over 15 years from increased income from pitch rentals and maintenance budgets and an external contribution of 100, uh, which in fact has turned out to be 110, and capital funding already approved in the 2021-22 capital programme to develop the track at Pericarius of 250. So that was effectively the explicit demonstration of the addition of the million pound and the funding of the million pound, and it was approved under the recommendation. Are you satisfied with that answer, Harry? Well, not not really, because that, that makes it clear it's part of one project, not not another. But look, I, I suppose I accept I'm not going to be satisfied. I'll, however, you'll be happy to hear that I think Amanda's probably just answered my second question. Right. So we'll leave that. I'll, I'll move on to a third one. Okay. Um, a few years ago, uh, Audit Wales uh, published a report, didn't they, improving project management for Conway County Borough Council. And this reflected on the experience we'd had with uh, Moptra didn't it? And it specifically said that Conway had taken steps, that I'll read it now, uh, that it believes will prevent a repeat of the issues it faced with the property lease at Moctra Commerce Park. Now, I appreciate that with Aeris, we weren't leasing a property, but this was a significant property-related transactional bit of expenditure. You cannot claim that picking up a grass pitch and replacing it for 3G pitch is repair and maintenance. It is clearly a replacement with one item 
uh, or replacing one item with something that isn't identical. So, so the bit I'd like to query is specifically one of the things this council said it would do was that the council's senior leadership team would collectively review, uh, review, scrutinise and sign off any project. We've got a number of members of the senior leadership team here today in this chamber who haven't commented on this so, so far today. So I'd like to know what input they had personally into this and scrutinising okay. as a project. I will ask the Chief Executive if he wants to respond to that. Yeah, I'll, 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 I will respond, uh, Chair. Um, clearly, in terms of the process of approving the funding, that's been covered today. Mm -hmm. That project then proceeded in accordance with your usual capital investment in this type of facility. Mm -hmm. By, by procuring the right developers and by instigating that project. Not every single project that we undertake here has to have a project board, right? Mm. If we did that, we wouldn't move things forward at all. So in terms of the investment that's been done there, we've had several reports that have come through explaining the capital program since that time. So it's been on the capital program since that time. So. We also, as has already been mentioned, the service itself is able to control its own project by the project, which is the capital in the economy and culture um, service. So they monitor that program as well. So in, in light of that, I, I personally consider that we, we allow our officers to undertake these roles by giving them the authority within that capital program to undertake that. If we didn't, we wouldn't move anything on. And that's what's happened here. Now, we've this pitch has been installed. It's been approved. It's been licensed. It's, it's gone through all the hoops. So I'm not really sure what more we could have done to ensure that this pitch was laid to the appropriate standard. So from an officer's point of view, I am satisfied that we've undertaken the work to a standard which has now complied with the requirements of all the licensing licensing authorities, be that FIFA, WIU, but also has been approved and it is now under warranty. So, in that respect, I'm satisfied that this work has been done to that standard because they have they have passed that test. Could I come back? Yes, very quickly. I I take the chief executive's point he, he's tried to make that officers need to be left to get on with delivering projects. I, I also take on, on board that you wouldn't necessarily have a project board for every single project. I'm, I'm looking and I've got printed out in front of me what this council supposedly told Audit Wales, which is that any project of more than £250,000 that related to property would be managed in this way. So you, you're saying that we wouldn't do that. Why do the Wales Audit Office seem to think different? For clarity, yeah. that reflects the leasing or purchasing of individual properties that's what we do they come to slt at if we are purchasing or a, a property at the value of more than 250,000 mm -hmm. or leasing at about 250,000 it needs slt approval this is a project which is different this is this is a a replacement of a pitch it's not purchasing it's not selling it's not leasing it is the purchasing and the laying of the pitch which which would come under its own project so that's that's the mechanism that SLT has undertaken, and those those relate to purchases and and leasing of property. That's that's what the the standard we've considered done. I don't know what has not been clarified. One one very final point, yeah. and it, it it was just to pick up what the chief executive said about this is replacing the pitch. Well, no, it isn't. The pitch that was there before was grass. This is three G. You're you're basically saying we've replaced an apple with a pear. It, it, it's not a replacement. It's still a pitch. Chair, I, I just like to that I don't agree with that observation. So you I just make to. that clear. Here we are. Bring them line one. Can I please? Thank you. If you just bear with me as I try and flick through my notes and not re ask questions that have already been covered when yeah, it comes well, down to it. Yeah. But, you know, I think there are two issues here. There is the governance issue and the line of how the decision was made and that then is reflected in the lack of scrutiny and the confusion around the whole thing 
um, because when I was looking at it, I could, you know, I was convinced that the 3G pitch was part of the pit, bid. The table two clearly links the pitch to the bid. And it's also stated in option 4.1 that it's part of the bid. And there was no option for a standalone 3G pitch in that original report. And I think it sums it up in today's report in 3.8, which says that the council did not specifically state that the 3G pitch would progress regardless of the success of the levelling up fund. And I think it's a shame that this has all muddied the waters because I think from what Councillor Aaron was saying, this has got potentially to be a really, really good scheme. But it's actually been muddied and soured by the fact that we don't feel that the decision was clear and that there was the opportunity for proper scrutiny. Can I bring, uh, can I ask... Uh... Uh, Aaron or the officers to respond to that point because I think it has been and I'll bring you yeah. uh, back in Gareth. are you okay with that? Yeah. Nani? Um, yes, well it was a part of the match funding for the uh, levelling up fund wasn't it? But uh, as is mentioned in today's report it wasn't contingent on the fact that we were successful with that bid but it was our allocated funding for the match funding for the levelling up fund. So that's why they were connected but they weren't mutually uh, inclusive if we were successful with one. Okay, sure. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, but I'm just saying that that's where, if you like, the confusion, I think, has come from and the misunderstandings have actually come from for what potentially could be a really, really good scheme. Because as Councillor Aaron pointed out, you know, or Amanda pointed out, it looks as if the funding the extra income has already been achieved, which is really, really good news. Um, and so I just ask how long that agreement is with the WRU for that extra funding so that we can have some sort of idea as to how long, long, long it's going to last for. Um, you know, are we going to be getting extra funding from area school? Are we looking for the athletics to produce extra funding just to spread the risk rather than having all our eggs in one basket and you know because there is a little bit of you know whenever you're going for these extra income you know you mentioned the crusaders rugby club you know i presume that we've done proper due diligence on the company and that we're comfortable with their funding streams and that the stability of that company and you know just the fact that the Promotions company has now gone into liquidation. It shows how difficult it is to rely on these extra income from events and other organisations and things like that. But I congratulate Leisure on this initial agreement with the WRU to actually cover that extra funding. And that's really, really good news. Um, on the life of the pitch, then, generally speaking, in accountancy terms, a 3G pitch is not regarded as a long-term asset. So, again, it's great to hear that we've got confirmation in writing from the manufacturers that it's, it's expected to last 15 years. And I just presume that we've had words with our auditors that they're comfortable, that we can depreciate it over a 15-year period. On the tendering for the whole thing, you know, we'd had a report from April 22 saying that there were weaknesses in our tendering process. So I was just wondering when the bid was opened, why there were no cabinet members present, which is, as I understand it, the norm when bids are opened, and why the amount, the perceived amount for the contract was actually the lowest bid was 340% less than the amount quoted on the document as the expected amount I for the contract. Quite a few points, valid points now. Can I ask for answers to these points up on? I'll bring you back in, guys. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Amanda uh, to. You know, with the WRV blend. Yes. Uh, uh, the depreciation and the tendering system. Yeah, I'll ask uh, Amanda to respond to the, the budgetary points. Um, but just on the point Councillor Gareth, you made about confusion, um, when the pitch was being, um, the work was going ahead, uh, I did have several emails from local members, and I did make efforts at that time to respond to those questions. And I've not had any new questions today. 
So I'm not sure what you're confused about, really, because I've answered these questions in writing and I've answered them here uh, today. Uh, but on, on the budgetary questions, I'll ask Amanda to respond. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, in terms of the uh, income, um, yeah, I, I think um, I, I totally understand what you're saying about not being dependent on a single source. And, and certainly uh, that isn't the intention. Um, I've, I've, the reference I've made to the WIU additional income is really I was just demonstrating that we've already generated that income and therefore I was just being prudent in that financial analysis. Obviously, the intention is to uh, and, and, and the anticipation uh, is that we'll have other income as well from from, as you say, sports groups, community groups, uh, schools, uh, etc., uh, and therefore it'll be there'll be a, a range of uh, income streams. Um, I must confess, in terms of uh, the length of time that we've got an agreement with WIU, um, I'm not cited on that. I don't know whether, um, unfortunately, Mali is unwell uh, today, so I know he's not able to 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 join us. But um, um, but it, it's been predominantly predicated this year in terms of the um, uh, growth and expansion in the women's game, and and certainly I don't. I, I don't believe that's a, a one-off uh, intention. You know, I, I, I see that as being something that will be continuing uh, over time because that was one of, obviously, uh, the big motivations behind the WIU's contribution to us to obviously uh, be, be able for the facility to be much more available um, for them to expand, expand uh, both the men's game, the women's game and, and youth uh, youth workshop uh, camps as well. Um, so, uh, you know, fairly hopeful uh, about that. But, but you know, as, as you mentioned earlier about the promoter, um, you know, we... You know, obviously these things happen and we can't foresee the future with absolute certainty. But what I what I absolutely know is that Mali is working uh, very actively uh, out uh, in, in the community to, to generate uh, income. Uh, and, and, for instance, in relation to um, concerts, um, you know, the, the contract with with uh, uh, that provider had, had come to an end this last year. And I and I know we've we've already uh, there's already a number of other companies that have approached us with interest in holding those kind of other events uh, at the thing at, at the facility so in that context uh, you know hopefully there will always be uh, a range of income sources available to us and certainly sufficient uh, in the context of meeting that business case which was which was just £34,000 of additional income. Um, in terms of the depreciation um, obviously I haven't explicitly discussed with the auditors whether they feel a useful life of 15 years on a specific asset which wouldn't be material to the accounts um, uh, uh, whether they're happy with that but but you know we we obviously in 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 looking at our financial statements the auditors will consider uh, our accounting policies uh, which includes our policies around depreciation um and and comment if if they feel we're not applying appropriate appropriate uh, policies uh, but as i say i think at the end of the day the, the you know the concept as 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 i appreciate uh, you're fully aware the concept of, of depreciation is 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 it's a measure of the consumption of the asset uh, over its life and 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 as i explained earlier uh, leisure services are are absolutely confident uh, that that the life of the asset uh, can be um it can it can will will be 15 years and as i say that's predicated on 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 their uh, the fact the barns 3g pitch is already 12 years old and and going great guns uh plus uh you know the 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 uh, maintenance scheduling and 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 routine that they they have put in place for the new pitch um in terms of the tendering process perhaps if i could uh not touch on that just for the moment because I only in the context of I'm just a little bit concerned we're airing into discussions about uh, the exempt items so perhaps we can come back to that when we get to that if that's okay thank you yeah well, you'll be glad to hear I've, I've almost reached the end but you know I'd just like to finish up by saying look there's some really really positive and good work on here there's some really really good news but as I said at the beginning it's just to say it's shame it's been tarnished by the fact that there's a lot of confusion and lack, lack of clarity and lack of certainty that we have actually followed the correct process. And it's all about the governance and the process. And, you know, you know, at the time I pulled my hand up, maybe I'm a bit slow on these things, but I didn't realize that this was going to go ahead anyway. And I'm wondering how, you know, there was a lack of, you know, not a huge amount of scrutiny. There's been a lot more questions and scrutiny asked today about the ins and outs of income and life of the pitch and all the other bits and pieces there. I think I asked one question on the life of the pitch, which Mike kindly came back to us um, and explained what, 
what his view was or what what the perceived view then but there was no opportunities and I'm just thinking you know did it not occur to anybody that the lack of questions on this potentially controversial and challenging project that nobody was asking any questions on it that you know did it not occur to anybody that a lot of councillors did not realize that it was a standalone project and did not depend on the bid um thank you I don't know if you want to come in back, but I think that point has been clarified, hasn't it? Uh, um, more than once already today, you know, that there has been, it's possibly just a difference of opinion. So I can't hear what Councillor Dilwyn's saying. Um, can you hear me now? I can, Dilwyn, thanks very much. You just keep the microphone just under your chin, if that would be great. There we are. I'll try. Thanks. I'll try thanks my best. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, uh, no, I think uh, the points that Gareth and Gareth agrees with me, uh, the points uh, that he brought up now, they have been clarified, and we'll move on to the next question now. Thank you, Mr. Uh, now I've got Councillor Paul. Chairman, um, as a new councillor, uh, when this came before us in the summer, um, I saw no reason to scrutinise it more thoroughly than I scrutinised it and voted for it, because at the time it seemed what was in that report um, didn't put any red flags up for me. So it happened on my watch and I take full responsibility for that decision uh, last summer. Um, what has frustrated me, oh, and I absolutely happy to support the most rigorous scrutiny of anything but what has frustrated me over the period since uh, the many questions were then subsequently asked um which has culminated today which again i'm i'm happy with is i just don't understand why our senior officers have said today everything was done uh, in compliance with governance in compliance with the law and um, in a sense there's nothing to see here because we are giving you our professional opinion this whole matter uh, was done correctly i mean councillor louise has uncomfortably challenged the senior officers to say nothing you say is going to make me believe it was legal which is without having a legal opinion I feel very uncomfortable with that challenge because, in a sense, um, we've got to uh, value our professional officers' legal opinions because um, we're not lawyers, we're not financiers, uh, and we have to accept them. So I would be really helpful to me if the chief exec could say, why couldn't this matter i mean i found the special council meeting deeply uncomfortable why why under our scrutiny procedures the definitive statement could not be made much earlier and then we wouldn't have had all this deep discomfort that we've had um i will i have asked matt and the chief executive it's up to you which one of you wants to come in first but i think uh some of the points that you raised there have already been clarified, Councillor uh, Paul, but I'll ask the Chief Executive. I'll, I'll come in on, on, yeah. on Councillor Paul's final point. I'm not sure if Matt wants to come in on the general legal point, but um, yeah, I, I, I completely understand uh, the question. Uh, the only thing I would say is I, I think it was raised at the July frost meeting. And what we want to make sure when we bring a document before scrutiny is it has all the information that you need. So um, what we don't want is to just put a statement out there without the information to back that up. So um, I, I, yeah, it is frustrating. It's frustrating for all of us at the time that sometimes things come through. But 
I can assure you that a lot of work went into it to, to make the report as clear as it possibly could be today to alleviate, hopefully, some of the concerns that, that were raised. Um, and, and to be fair, I think, I think we've had a good discussion here today uh, where you've been able to hear the professional advice that's been provided by, by um, you know, the Section 151 officer who has been in, in, in discussion with the monitoring officer around the different elements here. So I, hopefully that gives comfort to the, to the scrutiny committee today about the processes that were undertaken. I accept not everybody will be happy or have the same view, but that is the professional view that's been provided. So I hope that gives you some comfort, Paul. Just bring him up soon. Yeah, thank, thanks, Chair. I'm just conscious that I know that Amanda's covered this already, but uh, Councillor Paul's asked the question again in terms of the lawfulness of the decision. So the simple answer is yes, it was lawfully approved. Specifically, and this has been touched upon, any increase in capital expenditure above £500,000 has to be approved by the Council. The report was submitted to the Council requesting that approval was, was made for that increase and explaining the business case behind that increase and that that's what was approved and that was approved unequivocally that the, the approval the re resolution of the council was that the variation to the capital program 22 23 and the proposed funding source be approved that was the council's decision so it, uh, it, it, to keep it simple that's why the expenditure was lawful because then under, under the fprs of the council that are also within the constitution such approval in terms of the capital program, approves the expenditure that follows from it. There we are. So that's that's by clarity. Um, Nigel, is that a new hand or an old hand? It, it's a new hand, Chair. It's a new hand. Is it something that you have a, an, in addition to what you've said previously? Yes, it is. There we are. And then, uh, Councillor David, I'll ask you to come in afterwards. Thank you, uh, Chair. I just like I'm just really surprised. Some of the comments today, uh, Councillor Garrett, there's been so okay. many questions. There's been so many questions by his colleagues and, and the answers are falling on deaf ears. I'm just really surprised with Councillor Garrett and his colleagues. They just don't listen. And I, what I want to do is I want to draw the political media circus to a close. If I can, I'd like I'm to not, move the well, recommendation. I've got another speaker, Nigel, before we yeah. come to a close. Before we come well, to I do have a question. And that's the, on the recommendation 2.2 2 is, is that the leader requests Audit Wales Office to review the decision making. Well, they're already aware of it. So my, my question is to uh, Matt is, does 2.2 2 have to include that? Because I just think it's another waste of time. Can I ask you to come in, Matt? Yeah, Chair, I think that's a matter for... Um, uh, any proposer and seconder within the committee ra ra rather, rather than for me the, the committee have been advised that it's already been uh, referred There we are, there we okay. are. Well. Uh, Councillor David uh, Thank you Chair Yeah, uh, having looked at all the, all the papers I think my, my opinion is it, it's a, it was a very dubious <laughs> legal decision I mean that's, that, 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 that's what the officers are saying that everything was done legally and properly I think many of us think may, maybe not on that, but I think we need to look forward to the future, how this we don't get into this situation again. I think too many decisions are taken by too few people in this council. There were many members that weren't even aware that, that the 3G pitch was going ahead once once the leveling up that had failed, you know, and that's not acceptable. We need to talk more. And, and, and Nigel was saying about listen more. Yeah, I, I, and I think perhaps the cabinet should listen more really because it's not it's, it's, it's it leaves a bad test in people's mouths i think really that this is all gone ahead when people are you, were not are you pointing fully to aware of all, all the implications of it or the amount of money being spent so that, that's my point really chair that, that, that really we need to look forward to the future that we don't get into this situation again and i welcome yeah, the fact that, that it's been referred to audit wales thank you Thank you for that, David. Well, I've got no other speakers, so I will now come to Nia, who wants to make a proposal. Thank you, Chair. 
3G newydd yn stadiwm CSM Parcerias sy'n diogelu dyfodol y stadiwm er bydd pobl Conwy. Ac uh, efallai yn dri hwyr, ond hoffwn i gynnig nad oes angen gwneud cais i swyddfa chwilio Cymru i adolygu'r prosesau penderfynu y tu ôl i'r gwaith i osod y cae 3G. Ar wan gobeithio gawn ni stopio gwastraffu amser pawb yn arbennig swyddogion sydd yr amlwg efo digon o waith ar ei platia ar hyn o bryd. Diolch o rheoni a dwi mynd i dderbyn. Uh, I will accept both your uh, proposals there. Can I have a, a seconder? For the, Can I second uh, that, Jeff? Original proposal. And thank you, Nigel. And for 2.2, which Nia has also proposed, uh, can we have that uh, proposal again, Nia, for the 2.2? But the mangen, yeah, i um, gaveirio er a matter er with that, yeah. So, uh, will anybody second that proposal? That there is no happy to second that proposal, Chair. So, so, um, do any questions well, Chair, from you here now, Matt? Well, Chair, we've got a proposal and a seconder. Did, yeah. Perhaps we can take a vote on that on that uh, proposition. Proposition. On the Unless there is an amendment, Chair, of course. Yeah. Is it? Uh, is there an amendment? I would like to make another recommendation. Councillor Ch Chair, can you just make sure you're next to your microphone again, please? Yes, yeah, sure. yeah, I'd, like, oh, I'd like to make an alternative recommendation. Thank you. Well, Matt, um, the way you read the Constitution, can you guide me now on how to write this? Um, it, it depend I think we, we need to hear what, what, the re what that is, because it may be that that constitutes an amendment or it may be that it's a separate proposal and we do need to dispose with this proposal prior to considering and voting on any, any further proposals. So he, uh, perhaps we could hear that, Chair. And then decide. And then and then decide, is it, is it essentially a case proposal or, or could it constitute an amendment? I'm happy to hear it and I'll ask for your advice afterwards. So, Cheryl. Okay, thank you. Um, 2.1, uh, that um, we can't note the, well, we can note this report, but that the decision making process still wasn't clear that well, 2.1 that will be two... um, if i'm clear here if i can come in that will be a for or against is it well yeah it's essentially a counter proposal so yeah, okay. it's, it's not yeah. an amendment it's a counter proposal no, so no. I, I think in terms of one i think we can take the vote on what's take the vote on on either for or against and, and and if that's the same case with with, with the other matter uh, chair i think that the, the same same, same would apply two. it's the same with 2.2 Matt um, and this, my recommendation would be we, re we refer this matter to audit and, uh, audit and Governance Committee for a more evidence-based report with full disclosure. That's my proposal. And there I, we are. I will so, second it. Thank Matt, you. Um, we've had two proposals now. Do I ask for a second or do we just go to the vote on both of them? No, Chair. I think we dispose of the the, 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 the proposition. If that's lost, then clearly yeah. we, we, we've we've had don't. notice exactly. of, a, of, a, of, a, of a different proposal that we can then consider and vote upon. Yeah. So uh, I'm correct now in uh, asking you to show uh, on the recommendation 2.1 uh, whether if we're in favour of the recommendation to no cl uh, clarification on the decision making process and business case relating to the installation of the new 3G pitch at Stadium uh, CSM Park areas. Can you show if you agree with that recommendation, please? Yeah. Chair, can I just ask a question of clarification? Yes, I think, sure. I, I think, I think Councillor Nia wanted us to note and accept, not just purely to note. Um, so I'd just like a bit of clarification before we go to the vote. Nia, go you and see Claire Adam now. Yeah, that we accept that the the explanation of of the process is it's clear. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, thanks, chair. That's good to understand that. Okay, yeah. There we are. So, can I uh, can I ask you to show if you're in favour of two points one as it is now, and can you all raise your hands if.
who hasn't put their hands through. Chair, could I come in on a point of order? Yeah. Uh, for this, for Matt, um, what I've heard there from Nia is to note and accept, and that's and but the chair said put it up that it's as per two point one, which I don't think it is as per two point one. No, I think it was clarified, Chair, that that was to note and accept. It was clarified by the proposal and accepted. There was no, there was there was yeah. no indication okay. otherwise in the response. Yeah. 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 Hmm? Sorry. Chair, if we could just oh, yeah. Yeah. if if we can just we've taken for can we just take any votes against again? Uh can is we're taking the votes against two point one at the moment. Can uh can everybody show if you're against three? You got four online. One. All is together. it one that's online? Four. Yeah. Yeah. So that's been carried, Chair. 2.1 has been carried. 2.1 with the addition of the word accept has yeah. been carried. Yeah, there we are. Dioch. 2.2. Uh, uh, yeah, it was to chair that, that that was to not make a referral to yeah. the Welsh Audit Office. Yeah. Uh, to not make a referral to the office, which has been uh, proposed and seconded, hasn't it? So uh, can we show... If we're in favour of not referring it, uh, the motion to the auditor. Uh, if all hands are down now, uh, we're finished with the in favour. Uh, can you show if you're against uh, 2.2? Oh, if you're in favour of 2.2, isn't it? Of referring the more... Okay. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Matt? That's been carried, Chair. There we are. It's been carried. So, um, before we leave, um, I want to say on a personal note, who was involved all the time with... Yeah, Chair, I think I think there is there is still an outstanding... Uh, matter that that uh, councillor Cheryl had put forward, which was to refer the matter to the to the audit committee. So audit yeah, committee. so I think we do need to deal with that because that's a separate that is that's a separate issue. Do we have a second to that proposition to refer to the council's audit committee? Is there a seconder? We have councillor a se we have a seconder. Hyde. So uh, can I? Ask... Yes, sir, chair. I'll second that. It's been uh, seconded. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, Harry okay. seconded it, yeah. yeah. Fine. Um, so, can I ask now for you to show if you're in favour of referring this to the Audit Committee? Can you please show if you're in favour? So, we've got one, two, three online. Three online, is it? Hmm. Those against? That's been lost, Chair. There we are. Down. So, um, can I thank you all for your patience and for your time? We've had a, a good discussion. Can I thank Aaron and the officers as well for, the, uh, for explaining all the situations clearly? And uh, can I say on a personal note as well, I'm very glad that we've got to where we are now. And I congratulate the officers on the improvements that's been done and the cabinets and everybody who's been involved on the improvements that have been done. And uh, I'd just like to remind everybody of something I said, probably when it was being started in areas, is the explanation of the word areas and the translation to it. It's an old, old Welsh name. And it used to refer to when we had torches with a flame on them. That used to be areas. But more recently, it's referred to as a bright light. And the point I made then was, it's still the point I make today, that areas is a bright light. But not only that, it's the leading light in North Wales for events. And I congratulate you on the way that you're keeping it going. 
May I also remind everybody as well of how hard we had to work then in discussions as well of getting the WRU and others to support areas being developed then. There was a very strong bid from Wrexham and I think we need to bear that in mind today as we know how much money has been ploughed into Wrexham by other people, by people from the outside as well, and they definitely haven't disappeared. And uh, I'm so glad that Arias is now developing to a situation where we can still be the leading light in North Wales. Thank you, Chair. Over to you. Thank you very much my very able vice chair um there's been requests for quick comfort breaks so i suggest a five minute break now before we move on to the last report thank you very much <laughs>
Um, if we could uh, restart, please. Okay, are we thumbs up to go? Okay, thank you for that, members. Right, we'll move on to item 9A, establishment of head of strategic housing and subsequent realignment of heads of service responsibilities, pages 56 to 75. Councillor Charlie's going to introduce it and Tracy Pardo is going to uh, present the report. Thanks very much. Oh, and you as well. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I think we'll go straight over to the Chief Executive because it's a very fancy report, but something that I'm very, very supportive of. Thank you, Chair. Excellent. Economic with time there, Councillor Charlie. Okay, Chief Exec, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and and thank you, Chair, for allowing us to put this on the agenda um, late on. Um, I, you know, we, we have full agendas, so I, I really appreciate that we're able to 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 discuss this this morning or this afternoon, as it turns out now. Um, so, just in terms of background, I, I think you'll all be aware that um, since my appointment, I've been considering our structures and what we need to be deliver uh, the council's priorities. And following the departure of our strategic director in January, um, I did feel that we needed some time to just to consider what actually we needed. It's quite easy, isn't it, to just jump to it and, and, and make some changes at that time uh, and not think it through. Um, I did put some temporary changes in terms of line management in, in January. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm proposing as part of this report that, that the arrangements are made personal, uh, uh, permanent. Um, I'd like to thank the, the officers who have taken more responsibility during that time. It's, it's not easy, is it? You know, we're all busy. So having more responsibility um, uh, brings with it more work. Um, and so I'm really grateful for that and, and also the support of, of my SLT colleagues and SMT as well. Um, as we all are aware, um, for the past two years, housing has become uh, a crisis uh, across the country. Uh, we have levels of, of homelessness um, that we've never seen before. And during my consideration of what I wanted to do, clearly our priorities in terms of housing has to have to be addressed. And we've seen also with the, with the advent of the housing programme and the board, um, how much work is involved in delivering change. Um, and I think that was really um, having discussed with colleagues and, 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 and thought it through was, was something that we need to address. The, the size of our regulatory services is massive and it's unfair uh, on that service that we that we expect them to, to be dealing with a service that's exploded over the past um, few years without the need for more resource going in there at the strategic level. So, um, so really, um, Good progress has been made over the past, um, certainly over the past six months, I think, in terms of starting to get that tanker to turn in, in terms of making a difference. But I do think that we do need to be able to push forward at pace to try and deliver um, both um, our own priorities, but also in partnerships uh, with 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 our RSL colleagues. Um, and I, I strongly believe that the structure as proposed will enable us to move that agenda forward. There's clear synergy between our housing service and our property and estate service. Um, and they've been working very closely, but clearly that that, 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 that work will need to continue, but, but with even greater working together under the same service will enable that change to happen quicker in my mind. So in terms of the detail of the report, you see from 3.7, the changes that we're considering. Now, um, although it's setting up a new service um, that's part of, of this change, there are the consequential changes that I think that we that we need to make to make us more efficient in the way that we work and that the, the, the things are placed in the right places to make a difference. So um, I'll, I'll go, the, go through them very quickly. So, so in terms of head of economy and culture, uh, the county valuation of states to move to the head of strategic housing um, and then communication and marketing uh, to move to head of people and performance. Um, that is, um, and none of these changes have are any criticism of where they've been sitting. I'd like to make that point because a lot of fantastic work has been going on, but I would like to make the point that in terms of 
that communication and marketing, I think having it in a corporate function would help us in terms of the wider communications and marketing that we require as an authority. Um, and then as part of that change, health, health and safety then moves from people and performance to the head of reg regulatory service. And, and uh, of course, from regulatory goes housing. Um, and also we have been looking at re resilience and capacity in terms of our um, complaints and uh, information service. Um, it's a very small team um, and uh, there've been a lot of discussions over the past year, actually, even before I considered uh, this about moving it over to our audit procurement team to give it that more resilience, which I think that would do, and also keep the independence of audit because of its technical legislative nature. I don't think it compromises our audit function at all. So I, I, I think that's fine. Um, so, so in a nutshell, that that's that's the changes. Now, um, we've we've undertaken uh, an assessment in terms of the affected roles uh, through Corn Ferry under the Hay Scheme, um, and that's included in the exempt pack. So, if there's any specific discussion on that, clearly we'd need to go into closed session to discuss the the, the specifics there. Um, but you'll see from three point eight, there is no impact on grades. Um, and I, I'd also like to say that that we conducted a quite um, a very inclusive consultation process. So we've we've I've had uh, individual meetings with the affected heads of service, but also with an open invitation to anybody else within the services that are affected. And I've had a lot of um, really really good positive um, engagement with staff around it. Um, very challenging questions, which which you would expect. Um, it's a change, isn't it? So you'd expect challenge. And some of those challenges we've taken on board in the proposal before you. Um, and also I've, I've, I've liaised with my SMT team. And um, to be fair, a lot of very good comments made uh, around the changes and and maybe thinking about something different or, or alternatives, um, which I have taken on board and 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 and, and thought through. I do think this, it's quite easy to name. You can make a raft of different changes and go further and further and further. But actually, in terms of what we need and to achieve what we need, I think this is the right balance for me. But also, we, 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 as do, by doing this, we also have uh, a saving, a financial saving, which I think is, is also in these times, it's having that balance, isn't it, from, from having a, a team in place that can deliver for you, for your priorities, but also finding some savings. What we have found since losing the strategic director is that that we are, you know, we've do we have felt the difference. We have felt the pressure that's been on different individuals at that top table has, has, has been significant. So we need to make sure that that, that works for us as well. Um, and I think this this will give that balance. It will mean me having more direct reports, which 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 I accept and I'm more than happy to do. Um, as I explained to you on numerous occasions, I you know I have a real interest in housing in any event, and I have a real interest in in in, in delivering for the people of Conway um, by driving that. So by having that individual there to drive that service forward, I hope that we'll be able to make the changes uh, uh, that we need, um, both in terms of our homelessness, affordable housing generally across the county, be that on the coastal strip, but also in our rural communities. I think having having that individual there who can link in with our partners would be would be would be excellent. So um I, I don't want to take more of your time, but I would like to thank Tracy who's sitting here, who's who's has worked tirelessly over the summer months. Um and I'm I'm sorry for putting you under that pressure, Tracy. Um but uh, you know we really wanted to make this meeting and 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 the next cabinet meeting to try and gauge your views first of all but also um to, to move things forward if we can um and 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 yeah so thank you tracy and you'll you'll know from the recommendations in part two and i i'd certainly welcome your comments and scrutiny on those proposed changes thank you questions please members Are you all exhausted? Oh. Councillor Gareth, thank you. It's not really a question, it's much of a comment. I think basically Breen has set out how he wants to set his team and structure. Um, you know, 
it's how he, he wants to take it forward. And if that's what he wants within reason, we should support it. Thank you. Councillor Dilwyn. Yeah, uh, we and Kidwell and Hoshall. We and Kidwell oh, and Mark. Hoshall. Sorry. If you just. Yeah, yeah, the Kidwell and Hoshall are being marked at today by Shaw, Kevnocki, a sunny yard, Madam Obadar, and sunny yard. Are any questions tonight? We go back to the independent one yard, a ma hospital and to what era era senior employment team at the young Belnall. Nay, a danachi, a hos, um, and person specifications. Uh, Maganai question and vano at Wimol. Oh, sorry, sir. It's okay. Uh, it's broken. Okay, Maganai question and vano, uh, and and have all, uh, say my own day than vama, uh, the ability to communicate in Welsh to level at the Amondar XXX. Ag XXX, Ag um, Vasuni, Isha, Poydamar, Kilau, Ravana, Ir Suidama, Bobby and Nigel Develin, Kamrai Gangaridio, uh, or her with a Kaminetta, my poor Kamin, but in the end, but as the way ice, my uh, in uh, and Rickle, a ma, or her with a uh, Kaminetta, Sidon Calidelio, Hevo, um, Ak, uh, Hevid, um, Body Shotty Astoria Sound, or, uh, or Kaminetta, ma, are be mar, be matai, and a lucky, eriai, thirty wishians, Ak Sid, Mahi, ma, Pedio Calade Astoria, and I, um, and you've got an hail, hoilen, arash, an arch and community athletic name, um, are he not great one? Well, then it equals the reward, Maur and a blood of the summer, a true beat your cow, a mongrelonad, a carchevi or dangen, a vese and an artalois comregni, a dumo bonnet govle and vama, e vetricne to pass well both not deco, he power he destroyed. They are councillor Dilwyn, thank you. Uh Dirwor, uh Knora Dilwyn, um Clur were Thoroki er 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 so at na um Matar Ear Pushkar Kablokith with a donotia dana uh uh do sure gone either about dice uh honumi though near quibotai clown ear pushkar and na and lean and materials the caligoti. Um uh heavy to scores. Pan yn neud yr asesiad yna mae'n rhaid i ystyried um, beth gynna ni fel arall a mae gynna ni swyddogion gwaith chwel sy'n siarad yr iaith ar lefel un o dan hefyd a, a, a dwi'n gallu rhyw chydig o Gymraeg sydd rhyw chydig bach o helpu. Um, ond ond dwi'n dwi meddwl mae'n me, me sicr yn drafodau sy'n angen i gael yn dydy ag, ag, ag um, dwi'n dwi meddwl wrth symud ymlaen mae ma, ma, ma cael y drafodau yna'n iach iawn a dwi'n llwyr fe thorogi a fel dwi'n fel nes i glywyr yn, 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 yn hyfluniad lle mae ma, Rang hynion tai yn yn cymuned ag um, uh, trefol a yn uh, uh, gamglad yn hynod bwysig um, a, a, a ffordio dwiad yn enwedig yn wybodaeth da ni'n mynd i orfod, deulu o fod symud ymlaen, felly, um, ie, yeah, dwi'n gobeithio fe gynna ni, um, os ydy'r er, er materion ma'n mynd trwy uh, democratiaeth, um, yn ystod nos nesaf fe gynna ni ddyddiadau i'r pwyllgor um, gobeithio cyn diwedd ymwneud. Thank you very much, Reen. Uh, next speaker, Councillor Chris online. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think uh, Councillor Garris, right, where, when the Chief Executive comes to us and says this is the structure he wants, then we should be supporting that. But I do have to express a little bit of concern. Um, in particularly in terms of the role of the executives, we, uh, you know, we will effectively be reducing the number. We have effectively reduced the number of executives, which does mean that ultimately there is going to be significantly increased work on the executives that we have. And at the time when we're facing, uh, when we're looking at the significant financial burdens we have and the potential of uh, reviewing the um 
the tra the transformation of our services and transformation of our, of the authority. I am a little concerned that the um of the capacity to deliver on that in the executive area, but I'm sure officers will take that into account when they come forward with their transformation pr uh, proposals. I um, one thing I do need to speak about is the housing, and I'm absolutely delighted. I've been expressing my concern now for five, six years, and uh, previous administrations failed to recognise the problem that was developing in housing. Well, I'm absolutely delighted that we're finally giving housing the recognition it deserves and the uh, a, a head of service in of strategic housing who can actually focus on delivering our, our, the needs of our communities in this really important area of work. At the end of the day, for me, housing is one of the, the single most important thing for a fam for any family or any uh, family, because if the roof over your head isn't safe, then you're going to have all sorts of worries and fears, and that, and that is going to impact your day-to-day -day life uh, to no end. So I'm absolutely delighted that this has been given the uh, a head of service to specifically focus on strategic housing. And I very much welcome that report. In doing so, I'm happy to propose the recommendations, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor. I think you're being a bit harsh on Councillor on Councillor Charlie, though, um, as the previous administration. I think he tried his best with housing. So we have the proposal there. We have yes. We the, the next one we have is Councillor Nigel, and then Councillor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, yeah, I fully support Reen in this uh, reorganisation. Uh, I think he's doing a sterling job and we need to support him. Uh, my only comments are is I, I don't agree with Councillor Dilwyn. I don't think housing needs to be a Welsh essential. I'm also mindful of the fact that, um, you know, we don't want to uh, narrow our gene pool. We want the right person, the best person for the job. And if Dilwyn wants to... Um, uh, be fair to all the people in Conway, then that should be admitted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor <laughs> Nigel. Um, Councillor Anne, please. Thanks, nice, Chair. Um, I agree with Councillor Gareth that um, Reen, as our appointed Chief Exec, needs to have the um, authority um, and the backing to, to appoint the team and the sort of structure um, that he thinks will enable him to deliver on the sort of key objectives sort of set. Um, I'm not necessarily supportive of a number of the changes, um, but, you know, I don't think I, I want to uh, to go into that here. I think maybe the only one comment I would make is communication, engagement, um, sort of marketing is really being a disconnect and has been all over the place in terms of where it sort of sits and where it lives. And part of, you know, I, I do accept the point that Rena's made about it needs to be corporate. But, you know, potentially the sort of the one specific bit of feedback I would give is I would think, uh, consider that he should actually have that, that team reporting directly to him because it very much spans the whole control of the council um, and is always at the, uh, the, 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 at the table um, and therefore can really be looking at, you know, where we need to be spending the time and our resources. I think there's a lot of work to be done um, on comms and engagement as we talk every time we meet. So that's just the sort of feedback that I would give. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Anne. Reen, do you wish to comment there? No, I, I, I appreciate that, Councillor Anne. And um, as you can imagine, um, there have been quite a few sleepless nights trying to think about different ways to get this jigsaw to work, because it's it's never easy, is it, to, to, to find what you want in terms of making it work. What I, what I am sure of is that we have now um, a plan in place in terms of our communications, uh, uh, you know, by setting, we've, we've set up some uh, an internal group, which includes councillors, uh, cabinet members, uh, and and the new head of service responsible for that marketing and, and, and comms will form an integral part of that. And, and having that connection with a corporate plan, um, I think is, is, is really important because, because that is our 
set out our priorities as an authority. You know, we've discussed housing today, but we have a vast array of different priorities that we would like to achieve for our people out there. So, so um, take that on board, Councillor Ran. Um, but I have full faith in 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 that service that they they be able to get the best out uh, uh, of that team. So, so hopefully that gives some assurance. But, but clearly, I I, I fully appreciate and 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 thankful for for the comments because you know, as I've said, the, the consultation process has included a lot of different views on different areas. So I'm really appreciative of that. Thank you very much, Reen. That was my question in conclusion. Are all the affected officers happy and, and content with, with the proposals? Or, you know, I'm thinking staff wellbeing. Is everybody happy with what's being proposed? Yeah, um, in terms of discussions we've had, um, that we've, you know, have been very positive in terms of, um, especially the direct, the affected individuals. Um, as with any process, they have the right to appeal if they if they're not happy with it. So so um, they've been given that opportunity, um, and and as yet we we haven't heard anything. So so um, yes, it's been a very positive engagement. I would I would say so. So hopefully that alleviates the concerns. Thank you very much. Well, I can't see any more hands up. You'd be delighted to know. Uh, we've had a proposal from Councillor Chris. Have we a second of these recommendations? Councillor Stephen? Okay, if everyone would like to show on these proposals. Two, three, four, five, six. Six in the room and online. Six in the room and seven online. Anybody against? Anyone abstain? No, that's carried. Well, thank you very much indeed, members, and thank you to all the officers that have taken part today. Apologies for the time, but as Councillor Nigel would be delighted to know, democracy and government has no time limit. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Chair.